first one is by uh, Dr. Pradeep Karna. He could not uh, come online because of uh, issues in the line. So we will, uh, the participant will receive his lectures. And uh, his lectures on metaverse in education. And the second talk by Dr. Supramaniam BK, the role of technology in a connected world. And the third one by Professor Samit Malik uh, on science, technology, and society, the evolution. So let me first uh, give a brief note about uh, uh, what is the uh, education or the uh, society 5.0. Uh, the definition by the Japanese uh, given a human centered society that balances economic advancement with the resolution of societal problems by a system that highly integrates cyberspace and physical space. So, there are a few things here. One is human centered, the technology should be human centered. Then the uh, economic advancement or the technological advancement should cater to the problems of the society. And the third one, it should be integrated with the cyberspace to the uh, physical space. So these three things are uh, the main aspects of uh, Society 5.0. So today we have Dr. Subramaniam, uh, who is going to talk on role of technology in a connected world. As we know, uh, people are connected through phones and internet. Uh, almost, uh, I believe, most of the people around the world will be connected through this. In addition to that, things will be connected. So we say things, it can be any, any uh, things apart from people. So anything can be connected now. So through the IoT, you can connect anything. Each thing will have a, a IP address. So everything will be connected. Things, people, every everything will be connected. So what is going to bring this technology to the society? There's a huge data generated by uh, the people and the things. So how are you going to handle this? Is it really beneficial to the society? So that's the uh, that's the idea of this talk. Dr. Supramaniam is going to talk on this. Let me read this uh, TV. It's quite uh, long, but uh, just uh, <laughs> uh, uh, summarize some of the important points. Dr. Subramaniam BK is the uh, retired professor of computer science, IAC Bangalore, and distinguished fellow, IR, IDR, BT Bangalore. Hyderabad. It's now Hyderabad now. Okay. So, Professor BK Subramaniam started his career in 1967 as faculty of IAC Bangalore. He also worked as visiting faculty in the University of Manchester. Manchester Institute of Technology uh, during 74-75, Indian Institute of Management Bangalore from 82 to 86, AIT uh, in 87, and retired professor and dean in 2004. During uh, 1967 to 2004, he has published more than 200 publications and six monographs. Advisor to more than uh, advisor to more than 25 years. Work for uh, computerization of government of government departments, Jindal, <coughs> Jainagar Steel, HMT, Mahiti, Sindhu program of government of Karnataka, Mysore paper mills, <coughs> and other uh, industries, several universities and institutions. Previous associations with the Society of Secretary to Karnataka State University. Karnataka State Council for Science and Technology, 2002-2004, worked as additional secretary to government of Karnataka. He's also a professor of uh, computer science in IIT Bombay during 78-79. Worked as coordinator to proficiency and 
extension uh, lecture program of AAC, Chairman in Power Committees, Campus Development Committee, Central Evaluation Committee. Major projects are COWA project, Department of Space, and other uh, programs. There's a huge list. Activities are uh, continuing presently in consulting advice to Tata Consultancy Services, Technology Advisor to Indian Bank, State Advisor to uh, Mahiti Sindhu Program, Member of uh, Curriculum Committee of IC, uh, President in Foundation for Advancement of uh, Education Research, Center for Budget and Policy uh, Studies, presently association with network design and implementation of more than 50 colleges, industries, and institutions. <coughs> his, uh, his area of interest are applied system analysis, operating systems, databases, data mining, and education technologies, distributed systems, optimization, and transaction processing. So we have a, a excellent speaker today, and I call upon Dr. Subramanian. As a token of our love and appreciation, may I now request our Dean, Dr. Edwin Chandramori, to honor our uh, chief guest with a shawl and comment. Dr. Subramanian DK, retired professor of computer sciences, IISC at Bangalore, and distinguished fellow, IDRDT, Hyderabad. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thanks a lot for all of you. And uh, I, I've changed the title a bit. I've changed the title a bit. What I said is because it's focusing. What you want? What I want to say is, engineering is uh, not uh, technical. Humanize engineering. That's my first uh, point. My second point is, I go from society five to society six. And uh, actually, Society 5 happily ignores uh, environment and ecology, which is, I was the professor of Center for Ecological Sciences, so I can't accept that. I want to go for Society 6. I will talk about that. But then I would, I, as uh, Professor Chandrasekhar uh, and Professor Chandrasekhar said, I will talk about the connected world. Connected world is, uh, I think we have multiple connections. We connected, get connected with the electricity first, then communications next, electronics and communications next. Then the computer con connectivity came for us with the online systems and commerce. I am expecting to be connected by intelligence in the next level. That may be in another five to 10 years. And my focus will be future ready, not future shock, okay? That's uh, students should understand that. So I would like to start with a couple of quotes. What Darwin says, intelligence doesn't matter. What really matters is adapting, adapting to changes. Randiji said that be the change you want. Excuse me, I have to use that uh, thing. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. So I, I think. Uh, but unfortunately, the final has to go there. And unfortunately, as I said, the, uh, the, the one of the earliest books which integrate, which looked at both society and uh, people, uh, technology was by Alvin Toffler. Alvin Toffler wrote the first book, which is called The Future Shock. Then he came with Third Wave and then he went on with other books. But the most important thing is, fortunately, that was a 70s book, 60s to 70s book. 
Future shock was written in somewhere in 60s. Uh, and from that, from that, we are going to uh, talk to him, etc. But fortunately, we did not have that future shock. We always anticipated and we want to be ready for future. So that was that's not what I've been trying to say here. Okay. Uh, and I want to remove the confusion between technology and engineering. Most of us do not know the difference between technology and engineering. We confuse both. So technology is not, engineering is not just technology. Engineering is the application of technologies today, not even a single technology. You apply, if you take a, a, a pilotless car, it has an IoT, it has a cloud connection, it has an edge, it has a 5G computing, a 5G communications, it has uh, image uh, reconstruction and uh, it has control, it has the, uh, machines and devices. So it is about a dozen technologies which are being put together and applied for um, uh, building a car which will run on its own without a driver. So that's the idea behind it. So engineering is an ecosystem. Engineering is no more a component. Unfortunately, our division of engineering is one of the biggest mistakes we have committed. This mechanical, electrical, civil, uh, actually, I don't know, it's a simple history. Do you know why the men named civil came? Anybody here can give me a guess? Engineering was originally with the military. That engineering was also called military engineering. When you started building roads for the people, they called it civil engineering. And that's how the word came in, but somehow it's getting stuck with us even today. So that's the idea with civil engineering. And let me, I think I want to make a small point here. What, what is connected engineering? What happened? Uh, what is connected engineering? You see that we have a large number of sectors in our society. I'm not going to read all of them, but you know, we have uh, health, we have, uh, you know, engineering is expanding, health, education, we have commerce, finance, uh, fintech, then we have government and so on. So all these are connected. You have the people there in the white box. And uh, from that, we have a communication, uh, communication system, which connects to all of them. So that is the connected engineering. There is also a cloud there where you do the computing. Okay. So that is a kind of a simple architecture of a connected system. Okay. It's a complex system. Okay. We connect the physical system. We connect the virtual system. We connect the cyber system. And all, now I would like to say we will connect the mental system. That's the next step which we are going through now. Okay. But the, the data is the universe today. And Nandan Nilekani said data is the oil. Okay? But I will I go one step further. Data is the center of the universe. That's what is really happening. All of us are slaves to data. Whatever people will say, we have all become data driven and the data slaves. Okay? So you see that every activity is with data. We are going to become slave for something else, which is AI. Okay, the AI and the IT, digital communications. These four are connecting and making us slaves to everything. All our systems, all our activities are all slaves there, all our societies, all our governments. Okay, there is a book called Man 3.0, Human 3.0, which says that, okay, you will become uh, a slave of everything and Politics will become irrelevant. I don't know whether it will happen or not. That book shows how politics can become irrelevant. Okay? And there is a, another book uh, called Cyborg. So you are, you are going to be a metahuman. You are not going to be a human. You are going to be a metahuman. You can have your body and can have a large number of parts inside, which are all processor-driven and sensor-driven. That's what is going to happen. That's what it says. Okay. Uh, 
uh, as I said, engineering is not technical. So I would I would not go further in that. So you can read it up because engineering has lots of components like quality, economy, reliability, all these aspects do exist with engineering, which is not technology orientation. The human orientation comes in there. So I'm going to skip that. What is the link between engineering and human? That history I want to give you a little bit because I have been involved with most of it. I think the first major link between humans and engineering started with computers. The first set of people are programmers. From the programmers, we came to... What's that? So you are the... You are, you know, who is looking at that? Yeah. No, no, see, yes, this is what is connected, but not that. Okay. Uh, that's a human link problem. <laughs> you can I see the problem of the human link. Okay, so initially it was programmers. They, we got the data processing, which dealt with accountants. But what it created was this large number of programmers and a lot, a large number of systems analysts who are pretty arrogant. When the customer wanted a, a, an activity to be done, they say, this is the way I will do it. You will be surprised to know that it is not that in 1970s this happened. Even in 2010 also, 2020 also it is happening. Infosys says, take it or leave it, okay? And, uh, and ERP came, when ERP came, SAP said that, this is what we are giving you, we will not make any changes. So humans are expendable commodities in all these things. So th that is the unfortunate thing. The reality of some amount of humanization was done, to me it is still minimal. See, when the payroll was the first one, we had a lot of problems. So you create a data processing industry, which did the job, Anyway, TCS was very happy that it got a lot of business. Uh, <laughs> actually, TCS started with a data processing activity before TCS, uh, which I knew about because I was part of it. Uh, then, you know, ERP also did the same. Then I did an enormous amount of, uh, uh, you know, customization of CBS, which is the core banking services. All of you use a, a banking systems. It's all core banking. I did it for uh, at least about a dozen banks in India, uh, including Reserve Bank and including uh, Ministry of Finance. Okay. And uh, Punjab National Bank, uh, Syndicate Bank, Indian Bank here, IOB, and so on. So many banks, including the uh, small, uh, the latest small banks, some of them. I did the CBS uh, implementation. Okay. Even that. Customer wanted something, the implementer will not do that. That's the unfortunate thing. He did the integration. He, if you take animation, animation has nothing to do with engineering. Animation is more with movie production. Animation is more with artists, with studios. Okay? So you realize that the human link is uh, becoming stronger from a simple user to uh, a completely controlled uh, person like an animator. Well, I don't think the engineer plays any role. He can't tell them, this is what you can do. He will say, go and jump into the dirtiest pool. That's all what the animator will tell him or the artist will tell him. So that is what, and AI is something else. Is AI is part of engineering, but AI is, it needs a linguist, it needs psychologists, it needs philosophers, and it needs logicians. So many people. And today, the first lecture is supposed to be on metaverse. Today is metaverse. Tomorrow you will see that is the world real or is unreal. The famous Shankara's dictum of everything is a myth. You will see it with metaverse. Okay. The, uh, well, as I said, engineering was separated. I have talked about it, so I can skip that. Okay. The, uh, let us come to society 5.0 now. I'm not going to define, I think yes, Professor no, 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 no. Mani has done an excellent job of defining that. You have heard it quite a number of times. Somebody else is also going to keep saying it afterwards. So I won't do it. But uh, the society understanding for engineering is still very small. 
That's one of the reasons why we want. I will tell you that as I said, when the computers came in, the industry went into uh, data processing business, and the academics felt that's a dirty job. That's not something which uh, academics should touch. So that's the kind of situation we have. Okay. And that's the kind of situation we have. Same thing happened. The, the, the caste system in this is still very strong. That, that's what was not happening. Then uh, I want to tell you something here. There is a person by name, Lick Lider. Okay. He in 1951 talked about human computer symbiosis. I would say Society 5 uses this concept. Human and computer are not two separate elements. There is a synergy, there is a symbiosis, there is a connectivity, there is a collaboration which is existing. That's why robots have become cobots today. Okay, collaborative robots. Uh, that is, I am telling you why I'm telling you the year is important to me, 1951. And AI started in somewhere around 1950. 1950, a man whom I know, I don't know him very well, but I have used his machine, Turing, Alan Turing, and whom Churchill said saved millions of lives. Okay, Alan Turing, I used his machine, design machine in Manchester University. Okay, he was a, also a faculty in Manchester University, not at the time I was there, much before that. Okay, he was the first one to introduce the concept of Turing test for artificial intelligence. Then 1957, the first AI conference in Dartmouth took place with eminent people who predicted in 20 years, AI will sweep the world. I think 80 years have passed by, AI is not to be seen at all. We see only primitiveness of AI around still, okay? Well, I think this human computer symbiosis, how do we get it? How do we do that? That's the next question I have here. What's happening? Moving? Yeah, it moved. Uh, okay, as I said, I would like to move for society 6.0. I'll tell you why. The first reason why I want to go to society 5 this is very useful for the industry also, is that our technology absorption is very poor. It used to be uh, many years in the beginning. For instance, I'll give you one example. Tesla was a man, if you are an electrical engineer, he's a man who invented alternating current. And he put up a power plant in Niagara. The year I want to tell you, please catch the year very carefully. 1893, Tesla built the uh, Niagara power plant in 1893. We had a power plant in Shivasamadram in Karnataka in 1903, just 10 years difference, that technology came to India. The Tesla technology which was there came to India and surprisingly Tesla put a 50 cycles engine machine, we put a 25 cycles machine. That's a difference between both of us. But in 10 years, we did this job. So we should pat ourselves on the back that the time difference is not very high. But this technology absorption is always very slow. We need to improve that. Then uh, I want to give you one current example. The yesterday's example. Uh, you all know that AMS computers uh, you know, were hijacked and then they couldn't get it back. It was all hacked. Okay. And then they have found out AMS has not done any upgradation of the computers for 30 years. You think it is difficult to hijack them or you know, hack them? So that shows the kind of ignorance. That shows the kind of negligence. Okay. Then I want to give you one more statistic, which I am very familiar with. See, many of our industries like TCS, went in for digital, about 10 years back, we went in for digital. And then we have been talking about digital transformation. Sad news is only 30% has succeeded. 70%, you know, struggling. I wouldn't call it a failure, they're struggling. 
fine. The question is, I think I, I just want to read that. The question is that we did not understand the digital and human capabilities and how to match them and how to take care of the human needs. So that is so that is one of the key reasons for why because we we have been spending a lot in the organizations are spending a lot of money on that. Okay. Okay, I think I, I can skip that. That is he talks about harmony between parts and surroundings. So I, uh, that's my next approach to environment. That is, I'm taking a quote from uh, Ravindran Tagore. So I, I want to talk about a few actions which we have done, where I think the society and technology have been integrated. Maybe I can talk about one or two where I think what is it we did that really clicked. The first one is uh, we were using uh, the mud stouts and their efficiency was 5%, which means every one of us needed one tree every year. So, which means we were cutting millions of trees every year. Okay. Uh, we, we were doing 5 to 10 kgs. And uh, so, the 5% efficiency can I convert it to 25% efficiency, which means I will reduce the wood consumption. I will reduce the deforestation. So that is what we did as a Astravale and government took it up and popularized it. Otherwise it would have gone through. So the absorption time was two years. Not 20 years, but two years. We call that as Astravale. That's the first one. The second one is Mahiti Sindhu. That's a program I was a coordinator. Uh, our Chief Minister SM Krishna said that Thousand schools have to be computerized within a year. How do you do that? It's a massive scale. So schools, you can't just put a computer in a school. It's an easy job. That's not that's a technology job. You put a computer, connect them, put a LAN, and then connect a server, finished. No, it doesn't work that way. 90% uh, of schools in the rural areas don't have power. So you have to provide power. They don't have a room to keep this thing. So we, we gave money first for building, then power supply, then we got VSNL to do the connections. So we, we and then we said we have to train the people. So we trained the teachers. Then we said that, is the program going all right? We did a quality inspection. We put uh, 20 engineering colleges, something like 300 faculty went around inspecting the schools. So that's a very massive activity which we did which was quite a success, okay? What was the success uh, factors? Number one, the school uh, uh, enrollment was less than 30%. It became 90%. Two, the pass percentage in SSLC from 50, it went up to 75%, okay? Number three, attendance became 100%, okay? So on, and then English literacy went up. So I can say that, but these three are very important points. So which showed the success of the program. Okay, then we had the Bangalore one, which, which I was also involved. And we call that Sakala. That's in time, you get all services from the government. You don't have to visit any office. You get this, okay. This has been running for more than 15 years now. It was offline, now it is online. Okay, so then, and then we have uh, FinTech. We were the first to start the fintech activity. Actually, we started with the Indian Bank here, and I built a device called IMFast, which has been taken, which can, which is mobile, which can be taken to the rural areas, and then you can do the enrollment, or, and then tell them that your enrollment is done, bank uh, account has been opened, everything you can do that. So that is the next thing. Which we, which is that I think people are involved. We introduce the concept of a business associate. Okay, who can do that? Some shop are there who can do this. Okay, then the fintech. Then we have a very massive program called NRDMS, covered the entire country. We were mapping all the resources there on uh, digitally and then maintaining them. This we did it for more than fifteen years. Okay, 
Then uh, health online, all of you know about our guests. Yes, yeah, I was not involved. Vaccinations, etc. Smart grids and smart city. Smart city gives you a lot of opportunities. Okay, one can do wonders with smart city. And it's not technology. Let me say that again. It's more of uh, human ingenuity which has to come in there. You have to understand. I was talking to Sudhakar in the morning when we were driving uh, here. I said, why civil engineering is not looking at planning? You see, we design cities without uh, drainages. So uh, every time there is a small rain, there are floods everywhere. Okay? Why, how do you avoid that? I gave an example. We have a, a very enlightened Maharaja called Maharaja Narwadi Krishna, Krishna Jodaya. In 19, I, again the year I will give you, 1903, when he gave permission for the Indian School of Science, okay, he was eight years old. He became Maharaja at the age of eight years. He gave us permission. Then 1915, he designed a drainage system for Bangalore City, which is rich. A city is now reaching to some of the places where the drainage is still existing. He has he has got such a vision that for 100 years he did a 150 years, we did a drainage system. Do we have that kind of a vision? That's the question I have here. Okay, so the drainage system is something very important. Garbage collection is another problem we have. Today, I think the, the major problem we all of us have is e-commerce. So you see that these are the things which are needed. So what we really need is the socio-technical, intelligent, I'm using a new term called multi -bird. It's not hybrid. I'm not talking about a hybrid system. I'm talking about a multi -bird system. I'm not even using the word fusion, which the Japanese use. I'm using the word multi -bird system because fusion is not possible. You can't put a, a man into the computer and computer, you can put a computer into a man. That's possible. But you can't put a man into the computer. So it's a hybrid system is becoming, I call it multi -bird system. Okay? So, uh, that is what is needed if you want to move further for the society 6.0. So we are going to move from physical connection to intelligent connection. That's going to be a very tough thing because you are, it's a emotional intelligence. I will not get into the other aspects of intelligence. I will show you my AI gradings a little later. It's an emotional intelligence. That is, I, I have some emotions. I have anger. The system should understand, act on that. I have a worry. System should understand that. I See, even the speech is based on emotional aspects. The frequency of the speech varies with emotions. Okay? So these are the kind of things that, because recognition is going to be a major task of AI. How does it recognize a person? You know, you, you walk, it doesn't take a complete picture of you and then recognize you. By the way, you move the hand, I, somebody recognizes you. you. You know a person, let's say you have met him for 100 times, even if he is 100 feet away, you recognize him. By the way, he walks. By the way, his hands move. By the way, his legs move. That's, that is recognition system, gesture recognition. So now we are talking about emotional recognition, not image recognition, not pattern recognition, not... Uh, Speech recognition. We go beyond, much beyond that. To be future ready, we have to be that. Okay? We see the character. So what we need is a socio-technological multi bridge system. That's what we have to conceive. This ecosystem is what we have to conceive in future. Okay? And we have to train our students accordingly for that purpose. Okay? And the most important thing is we need a shift from specialist to generalist. Why should everybody start saying, I'm an electrical engineer, first year I will start with electrical engineer. I don't want mechanical engineering. I don't want civil engineering. I don't want mathematics. I don't want physics. Why? There have been a lot of studies which have shown that success rate as you grow up, as you reach, I, I don't want to get to that, I can give a talk on that. If you grow up, the success rate is much more with a generalist than with the specialist. Specialist success rates are low. If you are an excellent programmer, you will reach to the next level. 
That's it. You won't reach to the top level. So the top level is, uh, if you want to reach, be a generalist first. That's a simple solution, I can tell you. How to be it is a different question which we need to answer. So we have been using crowdsourcing and expert sourcing a lot. Okay. Now, um, what were the reasons for, so I told you about this, so I think I can skip that. But, <coughs> but one of the key things I want to tell you here is solution matters. You see, again, another mindset change I am looking for in all of you, in a, not only students, even engineers, general engineers, this mindset I want. See, unfortunately, we think we use mathematical equations. We are big people. It's wrong. Just using mathematics has no meaning. Okay? We have become too formalized. What does it mean? It means we are narrowing our problems. The human mind does not work on mathematics, does not work on logic. We are the most irrational animals in the world. Even some of the animals may be more rational than humans. Because you can be quirky, you can have different ideas, you can you know, direct people in different directions, your intuition is very great. So you are irrational people. So you have to come out of that. So our solution procedures need to be very different. I don't think any industry problem gets solved with mathematics. Mathematics is a tool, remember that. But it has a procedure. And you have to follow that procedure. You have to accept the customer as a king and then go and do that for him. That's the important point there. So what we need is a uh, holistic approach. So what do I need is I have to put together not separately. Together, expertise, that's what the ML does. The ML, that's what your engineering education does. Uh, experience, that is what ML does. Uh, digital twins, that has become extremely common today. If you see the COVID uh, management, most of the COVID management in the country was done by digital twins. Particularly, I, I want to tell you about the success of TCS in uh, Pune, Pune city. TCS did the COVID management completely. Similarly, here also, I think IIT Madras tried to do something, but it didn't succeed very much uh, because of political uh, and other changes which are happening here. Uh, that's the thing. So you 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 and you use AI, and what is going to be important tomorrow is not mathematical techniques, but semantic techniques, which is languages. I think I want to give you a simple example for that. The IBM came with a machine called Watson. The Watson was a very good machine, and uh, with the blue, they could do, uh, they could beat any chess, chess champions and uh, international champions and further anybody, including Gary Kasparov. It defeats everyone, and it plays better chess. But it used simple search methods, brute force search methods. So they went. Uh, Einstein did one step better. Einstein is much more intelligent than Watson. Watson was money, much more money making than Einstein. <laughs> okay, Watson uh, did it better using AI techniques. Okay, then they found there is a game called AlphaGo. I don't know whether how many of you know it or not. This AlphaGo is a highly language oriented game. They built a machine called Alpha. AlphaGo machine which defeated the AlphaGo champions. And they, they have also devised a machine called AlphaGo Zero, which is working without experience. Without getting data in, it starts up initial learning and then uh, 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 playing that game. That is based on language. So the language is going to become crucially important, which is language I mean is semantics. I was, uh, Talking in the morning, then I was telling that uh, uh, Chomsky talked about Paninian grammar and things of that kind, which keeps moving around. So we need to really address that aspect of how semantics, because all our language is not semantic. I asked uh, Shekhar yesterday a question, if I say there exists FFX, why do I need there exists there? I didn't get an answer from anybody. Okay, so please think about it. You need to become make logic more, more semantics oriented, not syntax oriented. Our language is syntax oriented. 
we have to move away from that. So we need to move away from formalism to heuristics to semantics to other approaches, not just mathematics. We don't solve any problem by mathematics. If you are going to go to a restaurant, you want to order for your food, you don't use a mathematical algorithm to do that. Remember that. Okay. So that's the key thing there. So we have software also, a lot of approaches like Docker's. Docker's is a very intelligent approach. Yeah, we have our PC. Then we have doctors, all these did extremely well. Okay, so we have to do that. Uh, so we, and the, the, the solution procedure is more architectural than, uh, I know, semantic solution. So we need to build an engineering education to do this. That's what is really important. Okay, now I will say three characteristics, uh, two characteristics for engineering. Engineering should be borderless. I have been saying that again and again and again. It means borderless does not mean that civil and mechanical should join together. Or mechanical and electronics should join together. Industry 4.0 is what we did. But I want to go put society into it, humanities into it, languages into it, psychology into it, philosophy into it. I, I, to, my, to me, engineering is a philosophy. Engineering is not a technology oriented thing. It's a philosophy. So ask questions and get answers. That is what Einstein says. Then the second point, which has become very, very important today is limitless. See, that is extremely important for us. So uh, this, this I uh, already talked about. Generalized before specialized. Okay. Uh, and this is something which one of the earliest computer innovators called Vannevar Bush. Uh, who was a man who designed the first machine, Edvac, okay? And he built, even before that, talks about at that time. He says by specializing, you are not going to build a Leonardo da Vinci or you are not going to get a Benjamin Franklin. So remember that quote. It's a very interesting quote for you. So generalize is borderless, okay? Then I say said, the, the environment is very important, impact of our growth and environment. So I want to tell you why environment is important. You see, 1972, there is a club of Rome, which did a study. I, I, I know I had the report in 72 itself, and I read, read that. And that study said that the country will collapse. The entire world will collapse by 21st century due to over-exploitation of resources. And unfortunately, that is 72. In 2020, another study was uh, done at Yale University, okay? That says that the current uh, business as usual strategy, if you continue, 2040 you are out. So, well, it may become 2040 or 2060, but many of you will live 2100. So please see that, take care of environment. That's what it says. Actually, that's where I want the industry 6.0. So all of you stay in 4.0, I will move 6.0. Okay, my six, industry 6.0 is integration has to take further. Robots, drones, human interface, IR, VR, AR, voice and gestures, emotions, etc. Okay, and it affects uh, environment. So please reduce. So society sure, six should provide for, facilitate harmonious living of humans and other species in synchronism with nature. Doing its best urgently for enriching nature. I've changed that uh, definition of five to six with these things. Enriching nature, biodiversity, and species. That's extremely important to me. If we want to survive, you want to have sustained things, that's that this part is more important than the other part. Actually, there is a book called Abundance by Peter Diamandis. He talks about methods of doing this. Uh, I, I think I will skip that. I'll go to the next one. Uh, I, I can skip this also. What is the engineering today? Okay. I, huh? That's why I'm running. I'm also running. Yeah, I knew that. So if you see here, what I want to show you here is 
what do you know you will see that this is the universe what you know is what you know. hopefully this is very very small compared to that what is the engineering total engineering is there in that total engineering you know very small part okay so there are lot of unknowns which you there is not only engineering there is also societal aspects there are also other aspects are there and there are lot of unknowns are there do we really look at any of these things so what we know is very very small see most of you know tamil what does it say katrade kaiman kallalade that's what you are to all every day remember that okay so we are talking about smart city we are talking about travel cars it are pure engineering won't give you answers there <laughs> Okay, the engineering transforms. I am going to skip that also because the time is up. So transformation is happening now. Quickly, let me say that be smart to live, be smarter and multi-skill. Multi-skill. That's a key word here. Single-skill Java. If I know, I get job is gone. That's the important point I am trying to make. Big shift in jobs. Next five years, we will see millions of jobs going out. but millions of job will coming in so your 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 technology your engineering will become obsolete in 5 years better be prepared for that that is a future ready i am talking about get prepared for that so what are the challenges okay uh, I, i think i can also skip that most of it i have talked about the future trends there's quite a bit here automation and advancing uh, okay digital trends we have talked about web 3.0 is one of the major areas and uh, we, we are trending now i think i can skip that something so there are a number of question threads okay i am i'm going to skip that because there's no time what is the future system going to look like it is uh, the, the japanese call this cybernetics not cybernetics cybernetics it is an interdisciplinary area in which robotics brain science not machines brain science neuroscience information technology ergonomics this is japanese definition human society kansai engineering uh, physics sociology sociological sciences and ethics all intertwined that is what they are envisioning a future system going to be that's a japanese definition Okay, I think I'll skip the trends. So quickly, I will spend maybe a half a minute on this. What are the various stages of AI, and where are we? First, the AI was a logical AI, where we built the rule-based systems or expert systems, which did wonderful job. Okay, for a it a, it can replace a cardiologist. <laughs> okay, that's what it did. Then we went into experiential today. This is today's state. Number two is today's state. ML. but you see that when i go down to 9 and 10 okay so which means ai has lot more to go so evidential is the next one which we have to look at where we integrate knowledge with ai then we go to explanatory unfortunately our today's ai is not explanatory ml gives you an answer you don't know why i got the answer so explanation is required then we go to the analytical emotional behavior that is what cyber nix talks about then senses recognition and action then full semantics that's the uh, one where ai will understand what you say then understanding uh, further then uh, hybrid collaborative and finally cognitive machines so ai will go through all these processes so there are something like 10 steps of ai which i thought i should tell you don't think that ml is all everything okay there is lot more which are there how do we humanize i think i will uh, it's, it's important i don't skip that what are some human requirements see if when you design a system you take functional requirements please take human requirements that is what is important that's what it says you have to categorize user you have to handle the user 
interactiveness, okay, privacy, yeah, identity, safety, security, there are several issues there, okay, and then you have to do an integrated design. This is where I think engineers can be happy in doing this integrated design. Then summer, okay, so integrate society, ecology with engineer, make solutions people oriented. Green technologies are now mature, use them. So look for a multi build system. Two, that will be a great fusion in engineering. Three, build new interface mechanisms. Okay. Four, as I said, engineering is borderless. Use many technologies, many solutions, many behaviors. Okay. Engineering is limitless. Okay. I look at new problems. Don't look at old problems. Old wine in new bottle is gone. New wine in new bottle, or maybe new sake in a new bottle. Okay, AI will dominate next few decades. That's very important. Automation and uh, is going to become more complete. And robots, uh, you you become you get robots working with robots. Okay, uh, we have to reorient people to reduce the losses. Otherwise, losses are going to be extremely high. What is, I think, the most difficult challenge is mindset change of faculty and the students. Will a mechanical engineer think it is his world or it is not his world? That's the basic question. Will an electrical engineer will think all what we are teaching is electrical engineering and nothing else exists in the world? I know all everything that has to go. That's what is your remember. So locate what are what are the things I have not right? I, what are the things I don't know. So that is the unknowns. Make our education system and another thing is one size fits all. Our engineering solutions are all one size fits all. No go. No, you don't buy a shirt on one size fits all. You don't buy a dress one size fits all. So change where an engineer to go for multiple sizes, multiple people, people oriented, each person oriented engineer. You have to get into it. So make our education system modern, borderless, imaginative. Einstein said, imagination gives you limitless ways of doing things. Knowledge is useless. And the, the key factor there is behavior determines engineering. Not uh, not technology, not uh, solution, not management. That's it. Good job. I have done with your time. Thank you. Do we have time for a few questions? Any questions? Any questions, please? Okay, thank you. If there are no questions, thank you. If you have a question, you can put it to me by even mail. I will reply. I promise to reply. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your words of wisdom. No, it's words of wisdom. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Professor Father uh, and thank uh, you. it was a wonderful. Uh, Lecture, uh, thought provoking lecture, and he has gone beyond uh, society five, has gone to six. Probably we'll have a, a complaint next time. Okay, so thank you, Dr. Professor. Thank you. Thank As a token of our appreciation and gratitude, may I now request Ms. Hema Gopal, former Vice President, TCS Consultant, GenPAC, to honor our resource person, Dr. Subramanian DK, with a certificate and moment. We are running out of time, so I'll make it quick. <clears throat> Next up is lecture on science, technology, and society, the evolution. 
it's a different uh, dimension to this society uh, 5.0. We have to ask questions like, does society resolve societal problems? Will the mindset of the people will change due to technology? Will the philosophy of life will change by the advancement of technology? Whether technology enhances the quality of life, the vitality and happiness of life. So these are all uh, psychological aspects. So Professor Sambit Malik will talk about this. Professor Malik uh, is a professor of uh, humanities and social sciences, IIT Gauhati, and he specializes in sociology of science and technology. Also includes historical sociology and physio philosophy of the social sciences among his research interests. His research and teaching are in the intersection of philosophy, social theory, and science studies. I would like to call upon Professor Malik to give a talk. One second. Very often, 
we say it is a systematic systematized body of knowledge so but i always feel that science to me or to a sociologist of science that uh, science always is an input science always starts with an input and in very open to what in very about what the science is an inquiry into the nature and limits of a particular knowledge limits within put by limits i do not mean limits by limits i do not mean limits by limits i mean under what limiting conditions science is practiced or pursued and that's how we tend to look at technology and science people very often say that you know uh, uh, what technology is the application of science or so but i don't believe in these things uh, i can also say that you know science can also be an application of that is what must understand the dialectical relationship between technology on the one hand and science on the other and <coughs> and if you look at the way these concepts have evolved over a period of time in fact prior to oh, thank you so much prior to the 19th century philosophy was divided into two parts one natural philosophy studying nature and two moral philosophy natural philosophy is nothing but science in the present sense of the term in fact are we the, the term as you all know that the term science was coined by william webel in the 19th century prior to that science was known as uh, as natural philosophy natural philosophers or scientists in the present sense of the term are engaged in epistemological questions whereas moral philosophers or the scholars of ethics they are engaged in ethical questions i mean uh, to to buttress the argument to strengthen this this kind of uh, reflection i must say that uh, <clears throat> that uh, when i said uh, natural scientists uh, sorry i mean natural philosophers are engaged in epistemological questions then what is epistemology no epistemology is nothing but a body of theory of knowledge why is it so so precisely because of the fact that epistemology addresses certain questions like what is knowledge how is knowledge produced uh, what counts as knowledge but the way but but the kind of knowledge that we have produced whether it is accessible to everybody or not the kind of knowledge that we have produced is democratically distributed or not these became or these questions came under the purview of moral philosophy or ethics the moral philosophers are engaged in ethical questions that um, what is good what is bad what is right what is wrong that's why perhaps ethics is known as a study of or nature of conduct and when we came to integrate natural philosophy or epistemology on the one hand and moral philosophy or ethics on the other we came to arrive at right? modern philosophy of science if one has understood till this point then i think most of the problems will be solved then i think why i am telling you most of the problems precisely because of the fact that that how to integrate natural philosophy with modern okay and that's what uh, philosophers of science historians of science sociologists of science have been doing uh for the last Couple of centuries, at least, at least the last couple of centuries. That people used to say that uh, no, uh, uh, 
technology as such changes our human consciousness individual consciousness intellectual political consciousness but technology in a specific political economic setup determines our or or enhances our intellectual and political consciousness technology on its own can work like this had it been the case the same technology which is used in the united states of america and the same technology which is used in india there is a very there is a marked difference between a marked difference between indian intellectual and political consciousness and american intellectual and political consciousness that's why uh, one cannot have a universal okay that's why uh, <clears throat> when i said uh, uh, one must revisit the evolution through which um, technology and science have emerged or natural philosophy and modern philosophy have emerged uh, and and how to how not to separate these two branches of knowledge we have we have been trying to do this and such framework forces us to examine uh, the nature of uh, science normative structure of science institution uh, aspects of science based on certain empiricist rationalist frameworks when i say empiricist rationalist frameworks um, um, empiricists they suggest i mean empiricism is based on experience empiricists always suggested that no uh, seeing is believing if you if you want to believe in something you must be able to see that that is more empirical right and empiricist and that's why they said science begins with observations remains at the level of observations and ends with observations but rationalists suggested that no science begins only when it goes beyond objects and that's how science becomes trans observational in nature <coughs> and now uh, that's why i mean i must be thankful to uh, professor chandrasekhar Uh, for this kind of thing, for such invitation, uh, actually he looked at my courses on NPTEL, National Program on Technology and on Social Learning, massive open online course on Science, Technology, and Society, and there I was trying to look at these empirical, empiricist, rationalist accounts of knowledge science. Then. Uh, people may say that uh, we always ask what are the sources through which we tend to produce knowledge in the 21st century if i have to bring it down i will say that there are only two sources through which we tend to produce knowledge one is experience and the other is reason okay if i say that is that i reached chennai and uh, i was put up in jp hotel but i saw a ghost there yeah it's true truly i saw a ghost there seeing is believing i have seen that then i must believe in that but then there is no rational there is not even an iota of rational if i can see a ghost then others should also be able to see that ghost i don't have extra lens no that's why it's very important to understand the dialectical relationship between experience and reason <coughs> one just cannot say that no this is more important than the other or something they must complement each other that's why i always say that uh, in india 
we are actually we have been successful in building scientific institutions to a large extent but we have utterly failed in building scientific temper and therein society becomes poor i hope you understand that the, the, there is a huge hiatus between building scientific uh, institutions on the one hand and building scientific temper on the other okay uh, that's why this this kind of emphasis rationalist accounts are extremely important and um, technology and science uh, cannot be separated from social purpose uh, <clears throat> if you look at philosophers of science historians of science sociologists of science and so on even marx long back in the 19th century he said what is science science is a social case only as as uh, my previous speaker he, he has made my job actually very easy uh, he said it started with military engineering military technology and so on whether technology must be evaluated in terms of ethical considerations or not actually it came up after the second world because of the manhattan project open head and einstein the bombing of of hiroshima and nagas that technology must have an ethical face that we try to understand only in the context of the second okay and that's why each technology must be historically integrated science must be socially and culturally embedded and so on that uh, people are able to think that no 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 uh, all knowledge except scientific knowledge except within both except scientific knowledge is socially and culturally conditioned but later on with the passage of time we have learned that no such internalist account of science which suggests that all knowledge except scientific knowledge is socially and culturally conditioned is no longer sustainable in fact david blur thomas kuhn and others they suggested that no all knowledge including scientific knowledge including within both, all knowledge including scientific knowledge is socially cost politically manipulated geographically determined culturally embedded and and uh, <laughs> in such view is known as the externalist economics Now, can we go beyond such internalist, externalist, internalist, externalist issues? We are good too. He was delivering the Huxley Memorial Lecture in December two thousand two, and immediately after that, in a span of two three months, he passed away. Then later on, that. Uh, lecture was published in the journal of the royal anthropological institute the title of that lecture was participant objectivism not observation objectivism <laughs> he emphatically mentioned the point that uh science as a dynamic force We must go beyond such kind of distinction between internal and external division, uh, because at times it may appear to us that it is internally driven, but actually it is externally oppressed. Okay, now let me give you an example whether India 
So go ahead with nuclear tests quite often. Is it a scientific question or a political question? And most often we feel that no, <clears throat> uh, science determines its own course of action, but science today also is politically uh, driven. The argument, <coughs> that's why that technology is autonomous, unmediated by any other external influence uh, that molds society to fit its patterns, cannot be sustained. That, every, that, that, that technology determines everything else. Actually, the neutrality of any technological system is based on design and control. Let me give you an example. I feel that the way public roads in India is designed is basically anti pedestrian One may not, you may not agree with me, but I still feel that it is anti pedestrian That's why design of a public road or a system and who controls. One may say that, no, I'm using this Apple iPhone. I'm the owner of this. No. I'm the owner of this just handset. And if Apple can, Apple reduces the speed of this headset, then I'm also gone. Individual tends to lose control over their own belongings. That's why design and control, they become the basis to examine the neutrality of technology. That neutrality of a technology, I actually, we all read, that we always take the example of, uh, of the construction of the New York Bridge. In the 70s, I mean, Robert Moses, who was a famous engineer from the 30s to the 70s. Actually, Moses only, he was a main brain behind urban planning, city planning in Singapore, Hong Kong, and so on. And he was also given the charge of. He built a bridge of, of nine feet height. And at that time, public buses were of 12 feet. It was his intention that public buses should not enter the bridge. Now, who are the users of public buses? The, the blacks and the blue. That's why the construction of the New York Bridge by Robert Moses clearly indicates racial prejudice and class bias. Okay, and, and and perhaps I'm I'm I'm, I'm taking a more anti-colonial, uh, anti-ethnocentric viewpoints. Okay, okay. And ethnocentrism. I hope all of you know that we ethnocentrism is essentially a byproduct of of uh, of some kind of dichotomies, uh, civilized barbarism. That people used to say no, that uh, the, the, the British are civilized and the Indians are barbaric. That's why people used to say that Indians and dogs are not allowed. That's a more ethnocentric approach. I'm, I'm taking now a more anti ethnocentric approach to, to drive home that the, the neutrality of any technological system is based on the ways through which it has been designed and controlled. Who controls? And in this lecture, my, my purpose is to highlight that <clears throat> that technologies should be evaluated not merely in terms of their productivity, efficiency, people may say that environmental side effects, I mean, obviously, the positive benefits. But also in terms of the ways to which 
the embody power and all that's why louis mompour once uh, once bifurcated classified two types of technologies one authoritarian technology and the other democratic okay and authoritarian technologies are basically state sponsored mnc sponsored um whereas they don't try to look at but they are immensely powerful because the state the mnc they have <coughs> the political and finance capital and uh, uh but they are not sustainable they are not durable uh and and science in the capitalist world today has in fact entered into a state of crisis today due primarily to the subjugation of scientific uh, research to uh, the capitalist monopolies and military corpuses and the conflict between new discoveries and old ideas and metaphysical ideas and the hiatus between Building scientific temper and building scientific issues in the Indian context. Uh, I have, uh, when I was told that uh, I have been given half an hour, I thought let me take fifteen twenty minutes or so and give some five ten minutes for questions and answers. Okay, thank you so much. Questions. Any question, or else you can write to me. My email ID is s a m b i t sambit at i t g dot s e dot e. I may be a little late in responding to your mail, but I'll get an answer. No, when I was younger, I used to be very fast. I think I have become older. My speed has gone down. Okay. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Malik, for this uh, uh, different aspect to the technology. How the technology should be neutral, inclusive, and without any discrimination. So it's a new kind of approach to this, which is very important in the coming society 5.0. So it's really interesting, and I should thank uh, Professor Malik for his excellent talk, and uh, thank you very much. The next session will start now.
The next closing. Kindly mention silence. Students, please maintain silence.
Sir, nine in sir. Sir, nine in sir. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. 
Students, I'm glad to introduce our next session chairman, Dr. K.K. Tyagarajan, Dean, RMD Engineering College. Dr. K.K. Tyagarajan received his BE degree in Electrical and Electronics Engineering from PSG College of Technology, Madras University in 1986 and received his ME in Applied Electronics from Coimbatore Institute of Technology in 1988. He has written five books in computing, including Flash MX 2004, which has been kept as a text and reference book by universities. He has been invited as chairpersons and delivered special lectures in many national and international conferences and workshops. He has published more than 100 papers in national and international journals and conferences. He received Distinguished Faculty Award from Venus International Foundation Chennai, Indoor Global Education Excellence Award from International Benevolent Research Foundation Kolkata, and Best Administrator Award from Pearl Foundation Madurai. He has been recognized as Marquess Bahus Who in the world for his contribution to the technical society and his biography has been published in its 25th anniversary edition. It's really great to have you here, sir. Over to you. Thank you for your nice introduction. So, distinguished uh, participants from various institutions and industries, my dear students, good afternoon to all of you. We have three speakers for this session. All the three talks will be in online mode only. So I request uh, each speaker to take 25 to 30 minutes for their presentation and uh, five minutes uh, question and answer. So now I will introduce the first speaker, Dr. Narayana Sami. He is a retired professor from Indian Institute of Management, Bangalore. He is going to deliver a talk on digital currencies and social concerns. Dr. Narayana Sami was a professor of finance and accounting at the Indian Institute of Management, Bangalore. Uh, he received the degree in 1986 to 2021. He has a PhD in accounting from the University of uh, New South Wales, Sydney. He has qualified to be a chartered account, cost account, and the company secretary. In July 2006, Business Today named him one of the top nine business school professor, uh, professors in India. He was an independent director of the Indian Railway Finance Corporation uh, and Bank of Baroda. Currently, he is the chair of the Technical Advisory Committee of the National Financial Reporting Authority. He has presented his views on accounting and auditing regulations to the Parliamentary Standing Committee of Finance. Regulators and governments are divided on how to deal with the digital currency. Should uh, they permit with or without restrictions or ban them completely. So I think uh, you will get a good idea from the speaker. So please listen. Thank you. 
गुड आफ्टरनून मैं स्टार्ट ना गुड आफ्टरनून आई एम हैप्पी टू बी पार्ट ऑफ द इंटरनेशनल कॉन्क्लेव ऑन इंजीनियरिंग अ फ्यूचर वर्ल्ड फॉर सोसाइटी फाइव पॉइंट जीरो एट आर एम के इंजीनियरिंग कॉलेज एंड थैंक द ऑर्गेनाइजर्स फॉर गिविंग मी एन अपॉर्चुनिटी टू प्रेजेंट माई व्यूज ऑन द रैपिडली ग्रोइंग फील्ड ऑफ डिजिटल करेंसी एंड रिलेटेड सोशल कंसर्नस my attempt is to present the issues in a nutshell i would encourage you to read up more for a detailed understanding of the issues i have planned this presentation as follows first i explain the term digital currencies for the purposes of this talk next i describe some of the recent developments in the field that have received attention among investors regulators and others i conclude my talk with some observations on the societal concerns digital currency is a wide term that includes cryptocurrency virtual currency and central bank digital currency the merriam webster dictionary defines cryptocurrency also known as crypto as begin quotes any form of currency that only exists digitally that usually has no central issuing or regulating authority but instead uses a decentralized system to record transactions and manage the issuance of new units and that relies on cryptography to prevent counterfeiting and fraudulent transaction code ends it's a peer to peer system that can enable anyone anywhere to send and receive payments instead of being physical physical money being carried around and exchanged in the real world crypto payments exist purely as digital entries to an online database describing a specific transactions when you transfer cryptocurrency funds the transactions are recorded in a public ledger cryptocurrency is stored in digital wallets cryptocurrency received its name because it uses encryption to verify transactions this means advanced coding is involved in storing and transmitting cryptocurrency data between wallets and to public ledgers the aim of encryption is to provide security and safety the first cryptocurrency was bitcoin which was founded in 2009 and remains the best known today ethereum litecoin and ripple are among the thousands of cryptocurrencies much of the interest in cryptocurrencies is to trade for profit with speculators at times driving prices skyward virtual currencies are unregulated and may or may not use cryptography to secure their networks examples of virtual currency are amazon coins facebook credits apple pay and so on central bank digital currencies are cbd cbdcs are digital tokens issued and regulated by central banks which are national currency issuing authorities they are pegged to the value of a country's fiat currency such as the indian rupee or the us dollar in contrast the value of cryptocurrency or virtual currency is entirely market determined the goal of cbdcs is to provide businesses and consumers with privacy transferability convenience 
accessibility and financial security cbdc's also could also decrease the maintenance a complex financial system requires reduce cross border transaction costs and provide those who currently use alternative money transfer methods with lower cost options a cbdc addresses a number of issues a cbdc eliminates the third party risk of events like bank failures or runs any residual risk that remains in the system rests with the central bank high cost cross border transaction costs can be lowered by reducing the complex distribution systems and increasing jurisdictional cooperation between governments the dollar is still the most used currency in the world a us cbdc could support and preserve its dominant position cbdc removes the cost of implementing a financial structure within a country to bring financial access to the unbanked population finally cbdcs can establish a direct connection between consumers and central banks thus eliminating the need for expensing expensive infrastructure as of march 2022 there were nine countries and territories that had launched cbdcs the bahamas antigua and barbuda st kitts and nevis montserrat dominica st lucia st vincent and the grenadines grenada finally nigeria it may be observed that the countries in the above list except nigeria are tax havens that have weak regulations for exchange money laundering and taxation there are 80 other countries with cbdc initiatives and projects underway in february 2022 india's central bank reserve bank of india rbi announced that it would introduce a digital rupee by the end of 2023 the rbi launched india's much awaited central bank digital currency and has ready for retail users from the 1st of december 2022 though the reserve bank of india several times expressed worry about using digital currency it appears now it has finally accepted it and introduced it which stands both as a benefit and possibly also as a risk for the nation in early years digital currencies were a novelty but lately they have caught the imagination of businesses investors and speculators they have come to be used for a variety of transactions including some arguably shady ones here are some concerns about them the hype associated with the cryptos and the mind boggling returns that investors claim to have earned from them have led to a market bubble uninformed speculators chasing high returns in low interest regimes have not only burnt their fingers but may in many cases have lost their shirt as well the bubble has often been compared to the tulip mania of the 1600s and the more recent dot com bubble second according to the world bank the price volatility of digital currencies hinders their ability to become legal tender legal tender is currency which can be offered and accepted within a given jurisdiction such as in india the rupee is legal tender in the us us dollar and so on a report from the bank of canada illustrates this 
while changes in the price of Bitcoin range from plus 25% and minus 15% relative to US dollar, the Canadian dollar barely moved over a period of one year. Third, traditionally, cash was used by criminals for such illegal activities as trade in narcotics and weapons, money laundering, human trafficking, and terrorist financing. Some of the characteristics that make cash attractive to criminals are also present in certain digital currencies. These are pseudo-anonymity, store of value, and wide acceptance. With the emergence of digital currencies, criminals can digitally transfer value, allowing for anonymous online and cross-border illegal commerce. According to a published study, approximately 24 million Bitcoin part market participants use Bitcoin primarily for illegal purposes and almost half of Bitcoin transactions are associated with illegal activity. These users reportedly conduct approximately 36 million transactions annually worth 72 billion and hold about 8 billion in Bitcoin. So these numbers are slightly dated. So you may get much larger numbers if you look at more recent data. The first high profile arrest related to illegal trade using digital currencies occurred on the 1st of October, 2013, when the FBI in the US arrested Ross Albright, also known as Dead Pirate Roberts for running Silk Road a dark net marketplace on which illegal goods and services were bought and sold using bitcoins. The FBI confiscated 174,000 bitcoins and shut down the site. Fourth, bitcoin uses a publicly available distributed ledger of all historical transactions called blockchain to validate transactions. Bitcoin miners perform complex calculations using computing power and specialized software to create new blocks and validate them. The computing power required for this process continues to expand as the complexity of calculations necessary to validate new transactions continues to increase. Many Bitcoin miners have joined mining pools or companies who purchase and run specialized computers. Ironically, the economies of scale involved in mining pools has led to a concentration of computing power, making the distributed ledger much more centralized. Fifth, financial inclusion, the access of people to the formal financial system is a key factor in poverty reduction. However, worldwide, 1.7 billion adults remain unbanked. Many proponents of Cryptocurrencies argue that distributed ledger technology has the potential to increase financial inclusion since it does not require physical bank branch presence or expensive infrastructure to run. In March 2018, the group of 20, that is G20, Communique, stated that Quotes begin, technological innovation, including that underlying crypto assets, has the potential to improve the efficiency and inclus inclusiveness of the financial system and the economy more broadly.
courts end. Regulators and governments are divided on how to deal with digital currencies. Should they permit them with or without restrictions or ban them altogether? Algeria, Bangladesh, China and Indonesia are some of the countries that have banned cryptos. Cryptos are legal in Morocco, Nigeria, South Africa, and the US. For now, India has taken the route of taxing capital gains from cryptos instead of banning them. The recent collapse of FTX, an exchange for trading cryptocurrency, has raised questions about their use and regulation. As we speak, investigations into FTX and its owner, Sam Bankman Freed, are ongoing. Digital currencies are still evolving. As with stocks, bonds, and derivatives, the rules and the institutions governing them will take time to develop. I wish the conclave great success. And once again, thank the organizers for the opportunity to present my views. Open to questions. So you would have noticed that I didn't use a PowerPoint presentation because I thought a PowerPoint presentation is something you would have seen from morning to evening in this conclave. Everyone would be using it, so I want it to be different. A second, since I am speaking and there is no presentation on the screen, you have no choice but to listen to me. So this is one way of keeping you awake in this post-lunch session. Hopefully, you are awake. So thank you, Professor, for your uh, nice and informative uh, talk. And uh, uh, there is no question from the audience. So oh, may I ask a question? Yes. Oh, okay. So since the audience chose not to, so either my presentation is uh, absolutely lucid, so no doubts at all, or it is so thoroughly confusing that you thought there is no point in asking me any questions. So I, I would like to believe it's the former, although the latter is likely to be true. Anyway, I have a question. How many of you here in the audience have invested in cryptos? Just put up your hand. Oh, I am not an income tax officer, so don't worry. I won't take any action against you. Nor am I from the enforcement directory. Okay, so I just want to know because I read yeah. a lot that a lot of um, millennials, I don't think you are millennials, you are probably Gen Z. So a lot of millennials and Gen Z are investing in uh, crypto. So I just want to do a dipstick survey to find out how valid that observation is. So how many of you have put any money in cryptos? Just raise your hand. No hands. Uh, no hands? Only, I think they are lying. Only one. Oh, I think they are lying. No. Quite a few must be investing. Yes. No. They are not saying it because no. they are also think, students. Yeah, it looks like it looks like they think that might not look very nice to say that. But I know for a fact that a lot of people are, I won't say seriously into cryptos, but a lot of people are playing in the crypto market. The other problem is that it's entirely possible your parents are also watching this session and then they will be furious if they get to know that you are putting your money in cryptos. The money they gave you for your college fees and hostel fees and so on. So I completely sympathize and empathize if you are not being truthful, but don't think I am such a damn fool that I believe 
that you don't put your money in cryptos okay now next question how many of you intend to invest in cryptos put up your hand now this is only an intention you don't have to actually carry out your intention one two three i can see i can't see all the faces though four i can see five okay. oh, good maybe about 10 15 perhaps i think in this audience how many are there in the audience how many in the audience total number of number of uh, participants in the audience maybe around maybe 80 or so uh, professor it will be around 200 200 okay uh, here again you are not truthful because um, you really want to make money overnight so i am sure within you are you know, heart of hearts, you think I want to put my money in cryptos and then I want to become rich overnight. But let me just conclude my presentation with this. The best place to put your money, especially when you start your career, probably in a matter of one or two years from now, is the State Bank of India. Because State Bank of India is first of all government owned. I have, I'm not getting paid for this promotion. Okay. So State Bank of India is government owned. And almost every Indian has an account with the SBI. So it is impossible for SBI to collapse. So therefore, put your savings only in SBI. And just because somebody gives you some half a percent, one percent return more, don't do elsewhere. So I am done with this. So in any case, you want to ask me any questions now, you are free to ask. But I thought I would use this as an icebreaker to oh, encourage okay. you to speak up. So maybe if I, I, I probably appear to, uh, to you as probably a very cold person. Actually, it is cold. I'm right now in Bangalore. So it's very cold now. It's 19 degrees Celsius here during the day. I'm not sure Chennai is probably burning as always. So uh, do ask me any questions. If you have no questions, then thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. All the best to you. Bye. So may I leave now? Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. So our next speaker is uh, Mrs. Arati Krishnan. I think uh, she is ready to join.
हेलो मैडम आर नहीं मैडम नो रेस्पॉन्स यस कैन यू हियर मी प्लीज हाय यस मैडम यस मैडम शेल वी स्टार्ट मैडम आई विल इंट्रोड्यूस यस यू कैन स्टार्ट यू हैव एनी डीपीटी यस आई हैव अ डीपीटी Uh, you can share uh, the screen, madam. Before that, I will introduce you. Shall I share it right away or after? Yes, yes. Now you can share. Huh? You can share. You can share, madam. Any problem with it? Yeah, I have just shared. You tell me. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So, so far. Participants and students, please, please maintain silence. Okay. So our next speaker is okay. Yes. Please. Yes. Participants, please uh, listen, students. So our next speaker is this is Arati Kanna, Arati Krishna. and uh, she is uh, consulting editor of the hindu business line chennai she is going to talk about uh, financial inclusion and fintech services fintech refers to the technology applied to the financial product or service to improve speed ease of delivery customer convenience or reduce transaction cost i am very happy to introduce this is arthi krishna she is a cost accountant and mba by profession those who are going by bus can leave Yes, colors. Others can stay here.
So good afternoon, uh, good afternoon to all of you. See, our next speaker is Mrs. Arati Krishnan. She is a consulting editor of uh, the Hindu Business Line, Chennai. Mrs. Arati Krishnan is a cost accountant and MBA finance by profession. She has been writing about the financial products and uh, regulations for more than 25 years. Joining Hindu Business Line as a research analyst in August 1995, she went on to head its research bureau and was editor of its portfolio section for seven years. She has moved to a consulting editor role at the Business Line from 2014 while continuing to write on the economy, regulations, and markets for both Business Line and the Kindle. She was earlier a contributor to value research and currently writes on bonds, insurance, and stock markets from, for prime investors for her pioneering work in uh, writing on financial services and the economy. She was awarded the Sriram Sandlam Award for Excellence in Financial Journalism three times. She is sought after speaker at investor awareness events and is presently a member of SEBI Advisory Committee. She is going to talk about financial inclusion and fintech services. Fintech refers to the technology applied to financial product or service to improve speed, ease of delivery, customer convenience, or to reduce cost. So I request the speaker uh, to give her presentation. I invite I invite you, madam. Please. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. I thank RMK Engineering College for inviting me to address the students in this uh, two-day international conclave on Engineering the Future Society 5.0. So uh, I just listened to Mr. Narayana Swami's talk and he was saying that uh, if you have PPTs, uh, students may go to sleep. <laughs> But unfortunately, I had prepared my PPT, so I'm unable to go back on that. Uh, I hope that, uh, I mean, along with the information that I'm presenting in the PPT, I hope I'll be able to uh, give you additional insights, which make it more love, uh, more uh, lively for the audience. So uh, here goes. So uh, the adding the word tech, to any business has become a kind of a fad. So if you see in the last four or five years, a lot of Indian startups and businesses have been able to raise a lot of money from international private equity funds and venture capital investors. Now, the secret to getting money from these investors very readily has been using the word tech in your business. So a normal business which involves grocery delivery, like your Kirana store also used to deliver grocery to your home. So when that grocery delivery is called grocery tech, it becomes a business that the investors are quite interested in. Similarly, may, we knew many large tutorials or coaching centers which are running coaching for IIT JE, for NEET, for IAS, etc. So when they became ed tech, that is when it became a fashionable business and a lot of money poured into these businesses. Similarly, we did know about food delivery. So only when Swiggy and Zomato started calling it as food tech, a lot of VCP money started to come in. So uh, I think that is why it is important to de uh, define what fintech is before we go ahead and talk about how it has changed uh, inclusion and so on and so forth. So what is fintech? So fintech actually, unlike food tech or ed tech or grocery tech, can span a wide range of business models in finance. So 
whenever technology is used in any product or service to improve the speed of delivery ease of delivery convenience or reduce transaction costs it is loosely called as fintech right so what are some of the examples for example uh, when i used to write a check and uh, try to transfer money from one account to another especially if it is an outstation check it will take 3 days to go or get cleared land in the account right whereas if you do the same transfer through neft or imps within a few hours or even minutes the money will land in the recipient's account so that is that is speed right second thing is ease of delivery like um, uh, if you people have used you surely you people must be using paytm qr codes and things like that the utter ease with, with which you are able to pay any vendor i mean you just scan the qr code within moments the money goes and lands at the vendors you don't even know need to know his bank account details or anything that is ease of delivery right similarly such fintech innovations also improve customer convenience or sometimes they reduce reduce transaction costs so earlier if you had to pay college fees and you took a demand draft the bank could charge you 50 rupees 100 rupees some dd charges right but when you do the same thing through a say a net banking account or through a upi the charges also go away upi is a completely free service right so fintech has helped to improve the speed of some financial transactions or make it more convenient for customers or to reduce the costs right so technology has been a genuine enabler of financial inclusion in india what do we mean by inclusion so let, we will know when we go to the next slide as students all of you may not have bank accounts or some of you may have when you first join your first job actually uh, and you want to open an account in your own name for uh, crediting salaries etc the first thing you will come across is kyc right what is kyc rbi defines it as know your customer so whenever a new customer wants to open a bank account or initiate any financial transaction rbi wants the bank or whichever the institution which is opening an account to know their customer they want to know all your details this kyc norms are in place to actually make sure that people don't use accounts for money laundering and other illegal purposes but in practice kyc has become keep out your customer so if a person doesn't have a bank account and is trying to open it especially from the lower income groups people who are not in the salaried jobs the self employed people or uh, women who are homemakers etc kyc has effectively had become keep out your customer it was very difficult to actually open a bank account in the first place why was it so difficult because the kyc norms usually require the customer to provide an id proof which is you should have a photo id saying this is you secondly you need to provide a permanent address proof which means usually in our country it used to be ration card now not everybody has a ration card and if we have a ration card also if you are moving from one city to another the ration card will not have our actual address so this conflict between not having a permanent address and staying in a temporary address that always used to get in the way of successfully completing your kyc in some financial products personal verification was also needed so some official from the bank or mutual fund or insurance company had to come and personally see if you are the person that you are claiming to be so these three things actually acted as a big barrier to new people entering india's financial system so it was completely anti inclusion but it was technology that has removed this kyc barrier from financial products how has technology removed it there this is through three technology enablers one is the pradhan mantri jan dhan yojana so basically in 2015 the government said that every indian should every indian adult should have a basic bank account in his name so uh, the bank started a huge drive to open a basic bank account for every indian using very very basic kyc details secondly the uidai launched aadhar which became a unique a universal identifier for all indians so 
the identity proof that problem was solved as more and more indians got enrolled in aadhar they could present aadhar as the identity proof to fulfill kyc norms now aadhar also had contained your address so the ration card problem also was solved so proof of id and proof of address was contained in a single document a third enabler of this has been mobile phones so usually to authenticate whenever you log on or do net banking you must be seeing that Uh, the transaction requires a two factor authentication so apart from entering your username password etc you will be required to also uh, get a otp and enter this so the availability of a mobiles made this two factor authentication possible and therefore it solved the problem of kyc and it became know your customer instead of keep out your customer so once this jam trinity so uh, it was an earlier a chief economic advisor of india arvind subramaniam who called jandan aadhar and mobile as the jam trinity in his economic survey jokingly so the jam trinity has helped crores of indians open a bank account a basic bank account but which gave them access to a range of other financial services so this was the first step in which technology actually enabled the inclusion of indians in fact this jan dhan accounts have been uh, have attracted a lot of praise from global institutions like world bank etc who have lauded india for be, being able to roll out uh, this basic banking thing for so many indians because our population is always such a challenge to serve out right so um, we have uh, received a lot of accolades from these institutions for this jan dhan yojana and this jam trinity So what does Jandana Yojana account do? Actually, it it makes sure that every Indian, every unbanked Indian, has at least a basic bank account. What is a basic bank account? It's an account with no minimum balance requirement. So there's no five k, ten k minimum balance, etc. It is merely a savings account, and you can put your savings in it and earn a savings account interest. Now, if you look at the numbers below in this table, you will see how amazing has been the growth of this Jandana Yojana accounts in the last. Seven years, so it started with just twelve crore accounts in twenty fifteen. It has gone up to forty seven point five crore accounts by November twenty twenty two. That is why World Bank is saying nearly eighty ninety percent of Indians today have a bank account. The second thing was the number of rural accounts. So mostly in the cities and uh, even the tier two cities, people used to have bank accounts. But the main problem of not having bank account arose in the rural areas now jandan yojana has rectified that also because 31 crore of the 47 crore accounts actually have been opened in the villages initially when banks were asked to open this jandan yojana accounts they were all very very unhappy and they were actually complaining that the government is forcing this on them uh, already they complain a lot about priority sector lending so they said this is also another social scheme where banks will have to open the accounts but there will be no activity these people are not used to actually operating bank accounts so simply opening the account they will lie dormant and we will not be able to raise any deposits through these accounts this was the concern that most of the banks had raised when the scheme was rolled out but actually it has proved quite wrong given access to banking accounts actually a lot of indians have put their savings in banks if you look at the deposits if you look at this deposit number here it has gone from 10499 crore then to 176000 crore by november 2022 so if you look at the how much money these jantan yojana accounts have were holding in november it was as high as 176000 crore so this shows that indians who used to be outside the banking system they had a real need for a savings product right Uh, when you go to the rural areas or when you even look at poorer families in the cities mostly they look to informal uh, kind of savings products like chit funds uh, and benefit funds etc to save money now this is uh, this does entail a lot of risk because they are trusting a unknown entity they are trusting their neighbor or a friend and sometimes uh, uh, they do lose the money because these may not be regulated entities all the time whereas when they start saving with banks they are assured of getting their principal back and they are also assured of getting the interest on time in india actually bank accounts also have deposit insurance up to 5 lakhs so that protection is also available once people enter the formal banking system 
Now, the other thing that has happened along with this opening of bank accounts is that people have learned to use debit cards because along with the Jandan Yojana accounts, uh, what was made, uh, uh, sort of what it facilitated was the issue of debit cards to all these customers. These were called rupee debit cards. Now, all of us are, uh, the more affluent of us are aware of Visa and MasterCard, etc. Rupee is an India-based uh, facilitator of credit and debit cards, uh, which has now become a very, very large service provider to rival MasterCard and Visa in India. So, today, there are, in November, there were 32 pro rupee debit cards also in use. Once people have the rupee debit card, they become you know, they become, uh, the ATM network of banks becomes accessible to them and they can withdraw money from it, etc. So that has been a big empowering force uh, also along with the basic bank accounts. Now, the unique feature of Jandan Yojana is that there has been a special drive to open these accounts in the names of women. So actually it has helped women uh, enter the financial system far more than men. So currently women own 56% of all Jandan accounts. That is of this 47 crore, 56% is owned by women. So this has actually brought about a lot of social benefits. I will explain that when we come to the DBT part. So if any of you have tried to take a loan for the first time, you would have come across a very peculiar problem, which is a chicken and egg problem. What is a chicken and egg problem in lending? So today, banks will not lend you any money, even a small loan, personal loan, they will not lend you unless you have a credit score. Now, there are agencies called credit bureaus in India, uh, such as Sybil, Experian, etc. What they do is they collect data from all the banks on how their borrowers are repaying their loans. So they create a database based on how you how many loans you've taken, whether they are repaying on time, whether you're defaulting, whether you're uh, uh, you're closing the loan in time, etc. Right? And they capture all this information and convert it into a single credit score. So all of us who have taken any loan in our lifetime, we have a credit score which is captured with Sybil or Experian. Now, with banks actually uh, using credit scores, what has happened is. Only people who have a credit score actually get loans from the banking system or even from regulated NBFCs. People who don't have a credit score find it very, very tough to access any form of bank loan or NBFC loan. But the problem is young people often ask me, now if I can't borrow, I can't get a credit score. And if I can't get a credit score, I can't borrow. So what sort of problem is this? How do I solve this, right? This is the chicken and egg problem that many people face. So they don't know how to get a credit score first in order to get a bank account or vice versa, right? So Jandan Yojana, one thing it has done is it has solved this chicken and egg problem to some extent by issuing this overdraft facility of up to 10,000. It has said anybody with a Jandan Yojana can get an overdraft of up to 10,000 rupees. So it helps the borrower borrow a, sm a small sum of 10,000 rupees and establish a track record of repayment with the bank. Once he establishes it, his name enters the credit bureaus. Once it enters the credit bureaus, he gets a credit score and therefore access to other kinds of loans or bank loans, NBFC loans becomes much more easier and the person doesn't have to depend on the money lender. Now, there are many other products that this Jamdan Yojana has also enabled. So the, I already told you about rupee debit card. There's an overdraft. Apart from that, generally, if you see, uh, the people who most need life insurance are the poor, pe poor people. So in a family of five or six, there may be a single breadwinner who's earning, say, 10,000, 20,000. If something happens to that breadwinner, the family is left destitute. Such families really need life insurance. But even today, if you go to the large insurers, it, it is very hard to actually get insurance for such people because they will insist on many things like uh, proof of salary and uh, income tax returns and all that. So this Jandan Yojana, what it has done is it has made this basic life insurance universal for all the account holders. Any account holder can actually apply for this life insurance cover of up to 2 lakh rupees at a premium of 436 rupees a year, which is quite reasonable if you look at the general premiums. Similarly, it has also made available an accident insurance cover of up to 2 lakh for anybody holding the account. 
it has made it has opened up these people to the atal pension yojana where you can get pension of 10000 to 5000 per month after retirement based on your own contributions as well as the government's contributions uh, then there are mudra loans mudra loans are loans given to small business owners uh homemakers people running a business out of their home etc by the banks and uh, once you have a jandan account access to this loan also becomes easier there is another big benefit that the jandan yojana has brought about and that is the use uh, helping the actually the government and the fisc uh, make their uh, welfare payments more efficiently now during covid uh, you may all remember initially in march uh, 2020 suddenly a lockdown was declared right to curb the spread of the virus after the lockdown was declared all the small businesses shut down construction activity stopped so there was there were thousands and thousands of these migrant laborers stuck in the various cities and they had come from their villages to work in the city they are daily wages and they did not know what to do once the lockdown was imposed how to go back home uh, very little money actually to buy anything so at that time actually this uh, jandan yojana account came in very handy the government was able to make welfare payments like it made some uh, cash payments to uh, a lot of construction workers who had bank accounts so 5000 crores was paid during that time via this jandan yojana account so uh, if a pass if usually the government needs to make payments verification becomes a problem so anybody can come there and say i am so and so and collect the money but how do you verify so giving it to the right person now with the jandan yojana account which is already kyc that problem got solved and therefore a lot of uh, money transfers during that period happened via the jandan yojana accounts there was also a payment of 20000 crore made to 10 crore farmers uh, which was called the kisan samman nidhi uh, dbt also allowed 31000 crores uh, to be uh, transferred to bpl ration card holders uh, garib kalyan yojana so the, this was transferred to nearly 33 crore people so uh, after that experience actually the government has been moving more and more to try and transfer all its welfare payments only through only to directly to the bank accounts of people via the direct benefit transfer route so uh, recently actually if you see uh, 313 central welfare schemes from 53 ministries are using direct benefit transfer which means direct transfer into the jandan yojana account to make their welfare payments so this could be in the form of uh, uh, old age pension it could be mandriga payments it could be any kind of welfare payment so all of this is being transferred based on the jandan yojana so basically all this goes to show how the jam trinity it has enabled inclusion in many ways it has helped many people open their first bank accounts uh, it has helped the uh, people get their first insurance and accident insurance policies it has helped them establish a credit score and it has helped all these welfare payments to be going directly into the bank accounts of the beneficiaries with very limited leakage right now let us move away from the government part and this uh, basic financial inclusion part to the more uh, to the area which is attracting more uh, interest and excitement from vc investors and things like that and which is typically called fintech right so what is the fintech ecosystem in india so let us look at the various participants in it firstly the first constituent are the government entities they act as the infrastructure backbone of the fintech ecosystem so you have the national payments corporation of india npci has is actually at the root of upi and bmap and all that it is the entity that oversees and runs these fintech applications then there is clearing corporation of india which facilitates payment electronic payments from receivers to uh, uh, from givers to receivers there is the bharat bill payment system then there is the uidai which runs the entire aadhar ecosystem no financial activity in india is possible without the participation of banks because banks in india are the largest custodians of liquidity whenever any of us have extra money we just go and put it into the bank and banks today are sitting on about 140 lakh crore of savings of indians so 
you cannot talk of any financial product of, or service that doesn't involve banks. So commercial banks are one component of the fintech ecosystem. However, RBI in recent years has also come up with many other types of banking models, niche banking models, such as small finance banks, payment banks, etc., which are specifically designed to promote inclusion. Small finance banks, for example, are supposed to extend small loans of less than 50,000 rupees to um, small businesses, to farmers, to various special interest groups like that. Then there are these payment system operators. All of us in our daily life come across these payment system operators who offer wallets, mobile wallets, prepaid instruments, gateways, so that at the click of a button on your smartphone, you are able to make a payment, right? to any transaction provider. So even your vegetable vendor nowadays is accepting one of these things. If you go to the uh, roadside shop or um, uh, roadside stall to eat something, there you have these uh, wallets and prepaid instruments accepted. So the examples of this are entities like Amazon Pay, Ola, Ola Money, Mobiquick, and things like Phone Pay, et cetera. That the other aspect is how fintech has actually helped uh, many people explore stock market investments for the first time. So I don't know if many of you trade on stocks, but if you do, I'm sure you will come across Zeroda, which is the largest discount broker in India. So Zeroda, uh, platforms like Grow, Kuvera, etc. These are also components of the fintech ecosystem, which have actually harnessed the savings of Indians and allow even people with very small amounts to participate in the stock market, mutual funds, insurance, etc. Then there are peer-to-peer -peer lenders. So what is peer-to-peer -peer lending? Peer-to-peer -peer lending is basically much like your neighborhood lending, which is brought onto an online platform. So basically, uh, the P2P uh, lender offers a platform or an app where uh, different people who don't know each other can meet and lend to each other, right? So you may be aware of P2P lenders like Fair Centrum, Demonex, so Rupee Circle, etc. Finally, there are digital lending apps and portals. So uh, one thing which has become very popular in India is this payday loans. So many people who earn a little less, they are they, towards the end of the month, it becomes very hard for them to make ends meet. Now, typically, this is the kind of requirement on which India's entire money lending on pawnbroker ecosystem has been sort of thriving. So when people run short of money or suddenly there's a medical emergency in the family or there is a wedding or a death and there is a large uh, spending obligation, people cannot approach. Uh, generally, people are unable to approach the banking system. So they end up going to their neighborhood farm broker or money lender. These digital lending apps that have come up have sort of become a substitute for this street corner money lender or pawn broker. They facilitate unsecured loans from a NBFC or a bank that sits at the back end. So through the app or platform, you are able to ask for a loan and they give you loans. Typically, these loans can range from just two, three days uh, time frame to maybe a month or 60 days even. So we've talked a lot about how this uh, uh, this whole framework of Jam Trinity, etc., has helped uh, the financial inclusion. But uh, adopting too much technology, especially at the grassroots level, it also leads to certain challenges, right? So what are the challenges that this Jam Trinity has brought about? Basically, the challenges are that uh, the main challenge is this other exclusion errors. I don't know if any of you have. You may be having elder people at home. Uh, and if you, if you try them, uh, if you try to authenticate their biometrics, say through fingerprint or um, retina or whatever, for other authentication, you'll find that the authentication often fails. So this has become a big constraint now because other verification, if you don't have a smartphone and if you don't have two-factor authentication through OTP, suppose you want to use biometrics, then uh, this leads to a lot of exclusion errors. So there has been a complaint that actually uh, uh, a lot of people are unable to actually get their hands on this uh, welfare payments like PPT or uh, their uh, ration cards if other uh, uh, verification is made compulsory. So this actually led to a Supreme Court case also where Supreme Court said you can't make it compulsory to present other in order to avail of welfare payments. So 
we all know that once you step outside the major cities network tama connectivity is quite terrible sometimes inside the city also it is terrible in my house also i have to go to the balcony only and uh, sometimes speak because uh, the network is so bad so when the network connectivity is such an issue relying so much on smartphones and data and mobile data etc that leads to exclusion errors uh, to enable people in the rural areas etc who may not have a computer at home or smartphone at home to actually access these services uh, the government has uh, authorized cscs so uh, servicing centers computerized servicing centers but the cscs also sometimes do not function properly and people are forced to travel long distances to go to the csc and to get their um, other uh, related work completed uh, all of us are aware of the errors in the other database so your name and the other card will not match with the pan card then that won't match with something else so it will keep getting rejected so these kind of errors also happen and when they happen you have to visit the csc to get it corrected which becomes quite a challenge right the other thing is in india cash is still widely used we may be using upi and nft and in the cities but uh, if you the moment you step outside actually a lot of cash is still in use and uh, these people who open jandan yojana accounts etc to get their money out of the accounts is quite a challenge for them because to get the money out you need either an atm close to your uh, village or your place of residence or you need a banking correspondent who can help you withdraw the money now sometimes uh, the cash out points are not very easy to access so it becomes very difficult there is a lack of digital literacy also we all hear of newer and newer ways in which scamsters are actually taking uh, misusing our uh, details and uh, 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 taking cash out of bank accounts uh, sending people links getting some ivr codes over phone and uh, defrauding people and rbi has also noted a rising instances of such digital frauds and uh, lack of digital literacy now even people like me in their 50s actually uh, we we have learned to use a uh, we've learned to use a smartphone itself rather late in life so we may not be aware of actually how what all can be done to actually uh, uh, safeguard our accounts and to so i hear of a lot of senior citizens actually facing this instance of cyber fraud and being unable to figure out where to complain or how to get their money back Uh, a recent research study by dwara research uh, uh, found that 51% of the dbt direct benefit transfer recipients uh, saw issues and payments and they did not get their payments on time so this was due to one of these errors in network connectivity or say, lack of cash out points literacy etc so now let us come to the digital payments uh, ecosystem so apart from the jandan yojana accounts one initiative which has really uh, attracted worldwide accolades is this uh, uh, india's uh, payment ecosystem and how it has evolved um, earlier uh, net banking or neft or rtgs used to be used by big businesses and affluent people but during covid actually people became wary of going to atms and withdrawing cash etc so this led to a huge leap frogging of digital payments so if you look at the numbers here you will see that um, uh, compared to credit and uh, even compared to credit and debit card payments of 17 lakh crore today neft imps uh, upi these have become very very big in usage so uh, atm withdraw withdrawals were just 0.31 lakh crore in fy22 but actually upi payments were 84 lakh crore so uh, that much of money was being transferred through upi and people that many people have actually onboarded these digital payment systems upi particularly has attracted our accolades throughout the world i mean there is um, uh, now other countries are also talking of uh, how they can actually uh, transition their cash based economies to a digital payments economy so uh, this is the the table here actually shows you how fast upi has grown and you can see that uh the covid period april 2021 was the inflection point here which is when actually upi payments really went uh, uh, i mean they've gone up tenfold from that level in 2020 uh, only 1 lakh crore of payments were made through upi now it is close to 12 lakh crore of payments uh, in a month 
but what are the actually the shortfalls on uh, uh, what are the uh, problems with uh, upi i mean the government has been trying to trying hard to transition india to a less cash economy or even a cashless economy and uh, professor narayana swami also spoke of how they are trying to bring in a digital currency with central bank digital currency see the main problem in adoption of all fintech and also upi is that for 50 million of india's 1.2 billion mobile users are not smartphone users so if you see typically many of the fintech applications require downloading an app right whether it is digital lending or whether it is upi you need to download an app now 450 million users actually use feature phones and they cannot download any apps so rbi has been looking into this and it has recently launched this upi 123 pay which uh, people can use on their non smartphone users also can use in order to make upi payments so how this works is you either call on a number particular number and try to enable the payment or you authenticate it through sms so these kind of things this is a very recent launch so we don't yet know whether it is working well uh upi the other problem is there is a high transaction failure rate so you all of you must have been uh, uh, experiencing this where uh, you have basically you you gone to a hotel or something you eat and you fill and when you try to make upi payment actually you can't because uh, the thing has failed right so this high failure rate is because upi is a free service and the banks uh, perhaps are not put in enough infrastructure or back end investments to scale up their uh, uh, bandwidth along with the you uh, along with the phenomenal rise of the usage of upi so upi initially began with banks as, as their backbone uh, private players like google pay phone pay today have 80% of the upi market and rbi has been telling banks so you people need to buck up and make people use your own apps instead of going to google pay phone pay so rbi recently floated a discussion paper saying we should make upi perhaps a paid service because of all these constraints uh, but the government actually came up finance minister came up and said that uh, uh, the government is not in favor of levying any charges on upi because it is seen as a public good the e rupee or the central bank digital currency also poses a threat to uh, this uh, uh, upi now we'll come to the more interesting part uh, i am I, i think students i'm sure students nowadays do have a, a more than an odd acquaintance with the stock markets and uh, discount discount brokers like zero da etc have come up uh, 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 mainly using these easy kyc etc so today earlier if you had to open a dmat account or a broking account with a broker you had to sign a very fat document with um, uh, uh, say uh, 50 or 60 pages of signatures but today with video kyc aadhar pan etc you can open an account very very easily with zeroda and others so discount brokers like zeroda have come up and that has actually driven a huge rise in the number of indians accessing the stock markets if you see the number of dmat accounts in india it has gone up very sharply from near 4 crore to 10 crore just in the last 3 years so this is why you find so many young people today actually trading on the markets even looking at uh, options trading or mfs and things like that along with this a lot of direct mutual fund platforms like kuvera grow etc have come up where even 500 rupees you can start investing by way of sip in mutual funds without paying any commissions insurance aggregators like policy bazaar cover fox etc have made insurance purchases much simpler and you can compare insurance policies or bank deposits and choose which is the better one so this is also more on this how the basically fintech has enabled uh, uh, financial savings also not just borrowing it has enabled savings by way of sips and smaller towns have become uh, quite big contributors to mfs with 17% of the assets because of this uh, these platforms actually enabling inclusion of uh, smaller investors into mutual funds and stocks so one area in which uh, fintech has really created a difference is in terms of lending but this is also causing some sleepless nights to the regulators so one such uh, kind of lending is p2p platforms 
now in all uh, we all know of instances where uh, a friend or an acquaintance or a relative suddenly runs short of money and they come to us and say hey can you lend me some money can you lend me say 50000 i will repay it to you in two years right so in such circumstances if we are confident enough we do lend the money but there is no formal agreement or anything and we don't enter into a contract saying this is the interest rate etc now peer to pay p to p or peer to peer lending platforms what they is they do is they enable such kind of lending uh even to strangers so uh both you and the, suppose you are a lender and there's a borrower all of you download that app on your mobile phone and through the app actually you can make loans to unknown people for very short periods it can go from 30 days to say one year and uh, uh usually up to 36 months these apps allow so these pay to pay platforms are supposed to be registered with sebi and they are backed by a registered nbfc so even people with no credit score no credit record they can get these loans i know a lot of young people etc who lend on these platforms because they offer high interest rates like often these platforms advertise saying you can make two times or three times the interest rate that banks uh, offer on fds but you should remember that these are very risky endeavors because you are actually lending to a stranger uh, and uh, the fact that the platform is only a facilitator the contract is between you and the borrower uh, suppose somebody on the road just approached you and asked you for a loan would you give it that is how you need to look at lending via p2p platforms the default rates on these platforms tend to be quite high but the other big risk actually is that the platform can appoint a recovery agent so if the person doesn't pay the platform can appoint a recovery agent and to go and actually ask that person to pay and a lot of reports and complaints have come out about misuse of these uh, 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 the recovery practices not following rbi guidelines people using bouncers to recover and things like that because you are the lender you can become responsible for such actions so you should be very wary of lending on such platforms in the earlier days during election times especially in the northern states you used to hear of loan mailers right so banks will set up a small counter somewhere and uh, everybody who needs a loan will uh, will queue up there and they will be disbursed loans based on some identity proof and some due diligence by the bank manager now digital lending apps are actually the uh, fintech version of this loan mailer so unlike p to p platform where both the borrower and lender are on the platform and they are lending to each other in digital lending platforms as a borrower you can sign up and you can start taking loans from the app right many people use these digital lending platforms mainly for payday so uh, at the end of the month if they run short of uh, money or they are uh, they have a family occasion or something coming up they actually take these loans nowadays we also come up uh, come up on a lot of apps offering uh, quick loans like um, lazy pay uh, etc where uh, you go and buy groceries if you if you don't have money immediately you can take a loan for the short period for just that grocery value and you can sort of repay it later so even digital lending apps actually make loans accessible to the un unbanked population people without credit scores uh when you go to a bank and try to borrow even 5000 rupees they'll put you through a lot of paperwork these apps just don't have any paperwork they just take your consent online in the app and they uh actually disburse the loan and the turn around is quite uh, very quick uh, but you should note that the interest rates on these loans are upwards of 30% most people are not aware of this because the app simply tells them you have to pay 10 rupees for every day every day or something like that and people don't make the necessary calculations so when signing on to these apps you give the app a lot of consent i mean it can access your contacts your phone book it can uh, access your sms lot of personal information actually becomes privy to the app and you don't even know who is running the app because it's just an app on your phone at least with a bank or nbfc there is a physical branch and you can see who is running it and file a complaint right so after a big proliferation of these apps rbi actually conducted a uh, survey recently and if it found a lot of instances of malpractice in these apps so it found that 81 app stores were offering digital lending apps and of the 1100 apps 600 were illegal so it it found that though these apps are supposed to have be tied up with a regulated entity like a bank or a nbfc actually many apps were not following the rules 
uh, and there are a lot of complaints about uh, the apps not only charging usurious rates and processing fees up to 25 30 percent of the loan could go as processing fee also about criminal recovery practices so once they got access to your contact book or photo gallery they were found to be even threatening members of the family for non-payment or using pictures of women in the family inappropriately and all sorts of uh, really terrible practices, which is why RBI has decided to really crack down very heavily on these digital lending apps and is in the process of tightening its regulatory news on them. So one thing that RBI has made clear lately is that, uh, yes, it is in favor of innovation in fintech, but it does not want the fintech ecosystem to be flouting all the current rules in the name of innovation. So uh, what RBI is saying is that basically uh, uh, banks are at, uh, in a recent uh, speech at the global fintech festival, RBI deputy government, uh, governor Ravi, Ravi Shankar made a very uh, uh, clear set of uh, declarations on how the way forward will be on fintech. So he said that Basically, all financial products and services rely on intermediation. So the transfer of money from savers to borrowers. So at a time when the saver has money, the borrower may not need it. At the same time, the saver may be, say, sitting in Chennai and the borrower may be in Guwahati. So what do banks do? They actually close this gap between savers and borrowers, both in terms of space and time. So banks are the only entities in the financial system which can do this because they can accept deposits, hold deposits, repay deposits, give loans, etc. So what RBI wants is that any fintech player, they should not be lending, borrowing or facilitating any transaction on their own balance sheet. Any such transaction of lending, taking deposits, etc. should be done only through regulated entities which are banks or regulated NBFCs. So uh, dig all digital applications, fintech applications should, can only be a technology intermediation, it can be an app, it can be a portal, but beyond that they cannot hold their own money and lend it or actually violate any of the regulations that RBI has for lenders, whether it is banks or NBFCs. So uh, RBI has recently made these ground rules clear and the message is very, very uh, uh, clear after that speech. Um, that uh, fintech may be a very big opportunity in India. It may be drawing PEVC investors, etc. But with great opportunity comes great responsibility. So it is basically warning the fintech players that, uh, yes, you're free to tap this uh, opportunity that is there, but you also need to act responsibility and within the bounds of the regulations that the financial market regulators have set down in India. So with that, I'm concluding my session. I think I've overshot the time slightly. Uh, I hope the Institute will share the presentation with all of you and you people can go through it at leisure if interested. Thank you, sir. Any questions? It's already, uh, she has elaborated about the insurance, loan, pension scheme, uh, stock market, digital payments. She has covered everything. Uh, and how the technology is used uh, in these cases. All the things have been covered. Uh, Thank you, madam. Thank you very much. Thank you. I hope it was useful to the students. Thank yes, you. Yes, it is. Thank you, madam. Yeah, thanks. I think uh, we have uh, the third and the last speaker. Only three speakers uh, we had. Yes, sir. Join the biggest one. He is joining.
I said, I'm going to say. Actually, the next talk will be on Society 5.0. Society 5.0 and uh, world econ economies. The student, uh, any of you know about that? Nobody knows. Until he joins, actually he is uh, he is from uh, Cairo, Cairo, Egypt. So we have to wait, I think. Cairo, Egypt. I think uh, he has joined in another link which is going on in uh, another room. So he has to change. So please wait.
Hello, Professor. Hello. Hi, how are you doing? I'm fine. Uh, Hi. Sorry, I was actually waiting for like half an hour, but it uh, seems this. Uh, yes, yes, we are waiting for you. Uh, no. I, I, I use the. You, I, I will yeah. introduce you first. Okay, please. And uh, can I uh, share my presentation? Yes, yes, you can share, sir. I apologize for that. Uh, but I used the link I received. It seems I received the wrong link. It's okay. So, we have the next speaker, Professor Dr. Keshan Dinana. He is Assistant Professor at American University at Cairo, Egypt. Dr. Dinana has uh, over 30 years of working experience in strategy, marketing, information technology, customer care, and high-tech manufacturing. In addition, he has more than 15 years of teaching experience, both in undergraduate and graduate degree levels. His uh, industrial experience include healthcare, ICT, then real estate, food and agribusiness, agri oil and gas. He has followed uh, various positions in North America and his consultancy work uh, as vice president, uh, vice president and regional managing director and his consulting projects in Europe and the Middle East. He, uh, he has a wide spectrum of uh, business and technical areas. He has uh, taught MBA and DBA courses in strategic and international marketing at Arab Academy, Academy for Science and Technology. So I, uh, he is going to talk about Society 5.0 and uh, World Economies. I invite uh, Professor Dr. Keshan Dinana. Professor, please. Uh, Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, honored to be with you. And I apologize for the delay. I was listening to another speaker. Uh, but uh, thanks for the invitation. Really appreciate it. And uh, I look forward to share with you my thoughts about uh, how Society 5.0 will shape uh, new type of economies and how we really can uh, take advantage uh, of this. So uh, with that in mind, uh, I will start the, the presentation. Uh, basically, from uh, the, the theme that we've heard and the theme that you guys have been talking about, this idea of realizing society 5.0 is not really uh, talking only about the future. We have already started down that road. Uh, we have already begun our journey towards society 5.0. So society 5.0 is not science fiction. It's not something that we really uh, have to, uh, to guess whether it will happen or not. It really is about uh, uh, some key words that we are now trying to, uh, uh, to see how we leverage in the way we live. Uh, the idea of the use of data, the idea of creating new uh, uh, definitions for value creation, the idea of uh, making people live more comfortable, sustainable, all of those are the issues that we hope that Society 5.0 will, uh, will bring to us. Uh, from that perspective, we see that Society 5.0 as a concept is an encompassing concept that is not industry specific. It's not about uh, technology and computing. Uh, it really is something that will integrate in the way we live, the way we, uh, we get treated in healthcare, the way we move, uh, the way the, our cities will, uh, uh, will be uh, established, uh, the way we, uh, we deal with money. Uh, and I think we keep hearing every day about how these things are uh, evolving. And once again, uh, it really is all comes down to the idea how we can create a more sustainable way of living and a better way to create value for, for the future. There are disruptive forces that actually uh, can explain why Society 5.0 uh, is going to be a reality. 
Uh, first, first one is, of course, uh, the greater global connection. Uh, we've always been talking about how um, uh, connected the world is today, uh, and that uh, whatever happens in one corner of the globe uh, can easily be not only known, but can impact uh, the other end of the globe. Uh, the idea of the uh, urbanization and uh, how the growth in uh, uh, large metropolis areas is changing the way we live. Uh, the way we uh, we commute, uh, uh, it has also an impact on our uh, on our planet. Uh, of course, uh, technological changes that uh, is basically affecting every part of life, and of course, last but not least, the aging of the population. People now live longer, and as people live longer, this will create new dynamics, uh, both from economic and social implications uh, that will shape uh, society 5.0. Uh, this kind of revolution, uh, based on, on some of the figures, just to say uh, how we can talk about scale and scope, uh, are accelerating the pace of change 10 times faster, at 300%, 300 times the scale, with 3,000 times the impact. So the changes we are seeing will continue to accelerate. Based on this understanding and those kind of mega trends, and of course with the digital economy as a major enabler, uh, I actually uh, proposed in my work that there are five different uh, economies that we have to watch and that will reshape what we mean by value creation from an economic perspective. Uh, the experience economy, the sharing economy, the gig economy, the circular economy, and the purpose economy. Every one of those economies, of course, have at its backbone digital as a component. But once again, digital in itself is an enabler for those kind of new eco economic models and how this kind of new economic models uh, can create new kind of uh, businesses, new kind of uh, uh, work environment, uh, a new kind of, of perspective about uh, how we create value for uh, uh, um, society and how we create value for individuals. What I would like to do now is to walk you through those kind of economies so we can see some of the figures and the facts that uh, can support why this, this digital economy will be the backbone. For example, uh, the digital economy, we, we started, of course, with uh, the core uh, uh, sectors, uh, IT uh, and communication technologies. Then we start to see uh, digital economy platforms, e-business, and then we start to see industry 4.0, uh, precision agriculture, precision medicine, algorithmic economy. So it continue to define, uh, uh, to be defined at, at different uh, layers. Uh, these were some of the figures that change how the impact of digitalization is, and, and, and digital economy, of course, is affecting our world. Digital economy in Asia Pacific uh, uh, was $1.16 trillion in 2021. 4.4 trillion dollar in the EU, and the digital output uh, as percentage GDP reached 22.5 percent, uh, and digitization uh, actually is more powerful through the rollout of broadband and connectivity uh, by 4.7 times, and IC services will continue to grow by 40 percent. Uh, um, as it has done historically earlier. So it still shows the largest level of growth. And as I said, it's impacting every sector. Uh, in healthcare, e-health industry uh, stands at about $80 billion. Uh, E-education, e-learning is about $107 billion. E-manufacturing or digital manufacturing, $3.7 billion. And financial service, $57 billion. So the uh, impact of uh, digitization is across the board. And when we say society 5.0, this is what society is all about. It's about how people get educated, how people uh, produce products, how people manage their money, how people get, tre get uh, uh, treated. So from that perspective, we can see that uh, this digitization has a socioeconomic impact from economic growth at national levels, to job creation, to uh, promotion of innovation and competition, to uh, redefinition of social relationships. I proposed actually this framework and we, uh, we integrated this framework and uh, when we were trying to define 
uh, a vision and a strategy for digital economy in the Middle East and the Arab world. Uh, and this actually has these four layers, a foundational layer, which includes infrastructure, policies, digital skills, financing and governance, uh, a digital economy ecosystem of innovation that includes all the different kinds of technologies, whether talking about 3D printing, cloud computing, quantum computing, social media, robotics, and so forth, and how these digital uh, technologies will impact the uh, industries, uh, whether smart health, smart education, smart logistics, and how these industries actually ultimately will lead to the main objectives we want from digital economy, which is inclusion, affordability, and accessibility. The experience economy is, uh, an, again, uh, was enabled by the digital economy. Here, we're talking about uh, the creation of economic value that moves things from commodities uh, to what now we call it the experience stage that we even think will evolve with Society 5.0 to uh, transformations. So we went from commodities to goods, to services, to experiences. Uh, millennials now and new generations actually does, don't pay for products and services alone. The, pro, the, the differentiation comes from experiences. And even in the future, we'll see, as I said, transformational uh, uh, um, moves. And this is the classical example we'll talk about coffee. How coffee moved from being a commodity to a good. Uh, personalized uh, product that can allow you to sell a cup of coffee for five dollars rather than five cents. Uh, the size of the digital economy, uh, uh, sorry, the size of the experience economy and the importance of the experience economy actually continue to grow. So if we see here, experience related services has been growing at 6.3% globally, while goods has been growing at 1.6%. Uh, and services without the experience has been growing at 4.7. So experience adds value to the economy. And experience economy can be seen again in air travel, in retail, in uh, technology services. Ultimately, basically, we believe that experience will be king. And experience will redefine how businesses interact with their customers and will define what customers are looking for. The sharing economy basically is the idea is really re, uh, redefining the concept of ownership. Uh, and a lot of companies, whether it's in automotive, whether it's in retail, in media, uh, are really now redefining the word, uh, uh, the definition of the word uh, buying and selling. Um, uh, so uh, when people now start to, to uh, redefine their mindset about what to buy and uh, even uh, how to use what they already bought uh, for, through the shared economy and the sharing economy. I think this will have a big uh, implication for Society 5.0. It will have implication on demand, it will have an implication on consumption. And this is just a picture that shows that uh, uh, those young uh, uh, people actually can now uh, use the shared economy to get uh, everything for their trip, starting from the minivan they rent uh, to the dress that they wear. 44% um, of US adults are familiar with the sharing economy. Airbnb, for example, uh, averages 425 guests per night. It's 22% 20, more than Hilton worldwide. Uh, the sharing economy has reached uh, or will reach actually by 2025, $334 billion. And Uber operates in more than 600 uh, cities. So these kinds are examples of the sharing economy and why uh, people are going to be uh, adopting the sharing economy uh, more and more as we go. So 86% agree that makes life more affordable. 83% agree more life more convenient. 76% agree it's better for the environment. 78% agree that it creates building a great, stronger uh, communities. 63% uh, agree that uh, it actually engages with traditional companies. It's more fun to engage in this kind of uh, interactions, uh, sharing rather than absolute buying and selling. And 89% agree that it's based on trust between providers and users. And trust is becoming a major part of how companies can and individuals look for value creation. So uh, the gig economy, in my view, is where we start to see 
uh, a redefinition of uh, work. Um, and maybe some of you have heard that term a uh, couple of uh, uh, months ago, they were talking in the US about the great resign uh, and how a lot of people are leaving their traditional jobs and looking for uh, to become more uh, independent contractors. Uh, uh, of course, this does, does not come across in all industries the same way. Some industries leading the way, uh, but we can see it's really becoming uh, uh, more prevalent in professional services in ICT uh, industry. Uh, so it is gaining a lot of uh, ground, a lot of traction. Uh, younger people don't view uh, uh, lifelong jobs and staying with one company as the way to go anymore. They would like to see their life and the balance between work and life in a different light than older people like myself. So this idea of uh, how the sharing economy will continue to grow, sorry, the gig economy will continue to grow um, is a fascinating idea because it changes the definition, as I said, of, uh, of work. And with it comes all kinds of social implications. Uh, things like, uh, how about health insurance if I don't have a, a fixed employment contract? How about the social security payments and retirement? There's all kinds of interesting things that come that says that the gig economy uh, might have, um, of course, we have to understand that these economies interchange because of the case, for example, of Uber. Uh, Uber is a sharing economy from the asset perspective, but it's a gig economy for the people that work on the Uber uh, cars. So the question is, uh, uh, this kind of disruption uh, about how, what are the kind of workforce should we have in the future and what kind of HR policies will we have? and how do we, uh, as an employees uh, and employers, uh, re-address our value proposition? I think is a very interesting change that I expect to see in Society 5.0. Uh, the circular economy uh, basically uh, is clearly linked to a major challenge uh, that we all see today related to uh, the environment. Uh, but the idea here is that circular is a lot more than uh, recycling. It's the next uh, evolution. So here we're talking about having a circular economy that starts from product design, uh, not uh, not how to dispose of product at the end of its life, but actually uh, we have two streams, as you can see on the circular economy. We have uh, a stream that deals with biological materials and uh, another stream that talks with technical materials. And in both of, the, of those streams or the, both of the angles or two sides of that coin, we can see we can do a lot, uh, whether from uh, energy recovery to uh, uh, how we uh, maintain and this, we reuse the products, how we extend the lifetime of products, uh, the idea of remanufacturing. Uh, so this, this concept of circular economy also in some studies have sh uh, shown to have a big economic impact. Uh, according to a study that was done by uh, BCG, uh, Boston Consulting Group, they expect that the, uh, uh, the circular economy would reach about $4.5 trillion. Uh, and hence, uh, starting from materi material costs that continue to increase, that get people to think more about uh, reuse of material, the raw material, price volatility, waste, disruption, supply chains, all of these things make the circular economy more attractive for companies. So, uh, Summarize, I don't wanna, I might be skipping some, some slides uh, just to get to, uh, to the key message I want to deliver and to catch up on the delay. Uh, the uh, purpose economy is really another uh, fascinating uh, type of economy where we're trying to uh, achieve the triple aim of uh, having uh, not only profits, but profit and people and planet into uh, the uh, equation where uh, younger generations now don't think of that the only purpose for business should be profit making. So this is where the purpose economy come. Purpose economy is not charity. Purpose economy is not about uh, uh, social responsibility. Purpose economy is economic models where we can balance uh, the way we work to cover both profit and people at the same time. People, of course, we mean the social impact of the businesses. So the purpose economy has grown and has shown a very big growth uh, trends among uh, younger generations. 
is expected to continue to grow. There's a number of drivers for it. Globalization, of course, the advent of new technologies, uh, geopolitical events, cross-industry competition, and of course, as I was saying, the new millennial mindset. Uh, those are some examples and cases of companies that have used that social entrepreneurship and purpose economy models uh, like think, think Impact. This brings actually students in local communities uh, uh, in rural Africa and Latin America, uh, and it really sends students uh, around the globe uh, to make this kind of global connections. Uh, uh, Vava Coffee, actually, uh, it's a Kenyan uh, coffee uh, that uh, works with small farmers. Uh, and uh, traditionally, uh, those farmers that does not have access to fair markets now can through Baba Coffee really have that access to the market uh, and at the same time uh, create, uh, get more value for their produce. Ochten is a company that actually makes uh, luxurious uh, fashion bags, but then they work with artisans and, and, and uh, 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 low income, uh, so, uh, low income um, segments of society uh, uh, to make sure they create jobs. And since most of these products are handmade, uh, not relying on very high tech uh, machinery expansive, then those people can be taught uh, the arts and skills and use them. So to conclude, Society 5.0 is here to stay. Uh, it's already started. Uh, we will continue to see it evolving. Uh, Society 5.0 will create new economies uh, that has its backbone, the digital course uh, economy, but then other forms of value creation uh, will, uh, will come, uh, whether it's the value uh, for the uh, use of assets, uh, the value of disposing of and reuse of assets, the value of uh, social implications of the business. Uh, that defined, in my perspective, those five economies, uh, the gig economy, the purpose economy, the shared economy, the experience economy, those kind of economies, basically what we will see shaping fu the future of society 5.0. But... We don't expect this to happen easily. It's a journey that's going to be mired with uh, um, some, uh, what I call it, walls. And those walls are the things that we need to penetrate to be able for 75.0 to uh, mature. The first is, of course, the wall of ministries and agencies. Uh, government, of course, uh, plays a big role, either as a supporter for the, the development of 75.0 or a blocker based on the policies they make. Uh, the wall of the legal systems, uh, rules and regulations, the wall of technology and technology adoption and concerns about technology use, uh, concerns related to cybersecurity, con con uh, privacy issues, and the wall of human resources, having people that are capable to deal with these new economies and the wall of social acceptance. Um, so that's it for me. Thank you so much for your attention and it would be my pleasure to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for your uh, interesting and informative speech. Any questions from the participants, audience? Hello? Professor? Yes, I'm with you. I'm just waiting yes, to see if there's any questions for me. Any questions? How long it will take to implement uh, this one? Um, actually, uh, Japan has already announced it, and they are taking the lead uh, to promote uh, uh, the principle of Society 5.0. Uh, the next expo, which is 2025, that will happen in Japan, and uh, Society 5.0 will be the theme uh, for it. Uh, and as I said, it's a journey. A journey that already started, I think will accelerate start in the coming period. And maybe, as I said, with the Expo 2025 uh, uh, focus that will uh, that will take the central stage, become a global, a global known topic. Yeah. Okay. So any other question from Alex? 
No, no questions, uh, Professor. No. Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, presentation. Appreciate it and thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be with you and I wish you guys all the best for the rest of the sessions for the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.